you're out of Facebook jail. I'm not. I'm still deep within Facebook jail. I'm using. I, I don't know how I'm able to go on Streamyard. It's one of the because I'm using an app, I guess, to interface with uh, our uh, tech overlords at Meta. <laughs> Life of crime is a hard one. I tell you, it's not easy, is it? <laughs> now everybody was uh, <clears throat> asking my lovely bride, Miss Lisa, like, so Lisa, what talks are you giving on, on Monday? <laughs> and Lisa's like, I'm not. She's like, well, I saw you posted an event. That's rich. He's uh, he's in Facebook jail. It's fortunate that she has the patience of Job, isn't it? I know. <laughs> Doctor Botson is on. Good morning, sir. Glad to have you. Got eight folks are jumping on already. Good morning, Doctor Fuller. How are you, sir? I'm well, sir. How are you? I'll be better once I've. Uh, I feel like Pappy Leon. I've been banished to Devil's Island here. Because it's not even Facebook jail. At least you, in, if you're in jail, you know when you're getting out. This is like a I don't know idea. It's in the gulag. I'm in the gulag archipelago. That's correct. Me and Salsa Meats and we're hanging out. That's it. <clears throat> you're in good company, my brother. <laughs> yeah. Only he'll be a Nobel laureate and I'll be me. Tony is on. Jared is on. Good morning to the nine folks that are on. TC, let's talk about sponsors. Sir, can you tell me what that is? That looks like an AWS coin. Dang, you're absolutely right. So the sponsor of today's show, Coffee with Rich, brought to you by the American Warrior Show, is the American Warrior Society, America's leading self-defense community. And if you want to find out if becoming a member of our self-defense community is the right thing for you and your family, please check us out. Uh, follow the links and find out if becoming a member is the right thing for you. And I will tell you, in these trying times, it just might be. Will Rhodes is on. Says good morning from Missouri. Uh, good morning, Jay, out there in Hawaii. Wow, it is early where you are, sir. God love you. Zero two thirty in the morning. Whew. Will says I lost my Facebook account completely. No warnings. Yeah, Mister Seeklander, I believe, is in a banishment too. And I, someone has said, you know, the someone's like, I think they're coming after veterans because they were giving me a long list of their friends. He's not a veteran, but he's like, and they just seem to be all getting booted. And I'm like. It wouldn't surprise me. I have uh, really have no idea what's going on. Uh, we can talk about that briefly this morning. Johnny King is on. Pat Cahill from northern Wisconsin. Good morning, Pat. Yeah, well, I hate to hear that, man. Um, it's crazy right now. Dr. Fuller, we're going to talk about a couple of sponsors while folks are jumping on. Please like and hit that share button. Uh, Dr. Fuller has an amazing show for you today. I'm just going to be the gimp that rides along with him uh, asking questions. <laughs> but... I want to talk to you real quick about the, the Bob by Century Martial Arts, man. Makers of the Bob XL. Please ch uh, check out AmericanWarriorShow.com, right-hand side of the page. You'll find a link to all of our amazing sponsors. But I've, I'm looking at Bob right now. He's got my old judo gi top on. He's staring me down while I'm talking to you this morning. Uh, that's okay, Bob. You'll get yours here in a minute. Also, we'll talk about APPHemp.com. That's Appalachian Standard. If you're into CBD products, if you find, like, me that they help your old joints and your uh, I've got a my left shoulder keeps popping out of joint lately so it's going to be real fun I've got two jujitsu seminars coming up and uh, that's going to be really fun but <clears throat> CBD products man I tell you what they are really really good the salves the tincture a couple drops under the tongue good stuff check out my good friends over there at Appalachian Standard Mike Varley is on. My brother Jeff Brown is on. John Shriver is on. Coin number 1919. And if you become a member of the American War Society, you get your own coin number. Do you know yours, TC? I do. 1620. That was a lovely year. <laughs> all right, Dr. Fuller, sir. I am all yours. You've got a really good show together. I've been reading your notes here. Where do we want to start? Well, I mean, probably should I tell people what the topic is? Um, yes. You know, you can't turn on a television or pick up a, a, for those of us of a certain age, pick up a newspaper these days without hearing about what's going on in the Ukraine. And, uh, you know, the, the current administration seems to be blaming all of our latest economic woes on uh, on what's going on in the Ukraine. I think they're counting on, on sort of a general malaise and ignorance on our part to buy off on that. I'm kind of reminded of, and everybody who's ever been in the military will, will be able to, I think, the story will resonate with them. You know, the supply truck catches fire and burns down to the axles. 
and suddenly every hand receipt in the entire unit is cleared because all the missing gear was oddly enough on that truck. Weird. Uh, two and a half ton truck with seven tons worth of gear on it. Uh-huh. Uh, I, I'm reminded of that every time I hear the administration uh, blame our economic woes on the Ukraine and, and Putin. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. This was, this trend was coming down the track a long time ago. Um, <clears throat> so let's, yeah. let's talk about the Ukraine, but let's talk about it. Give it some context. This was really kind of the thought here. You know, everybody has heard of the Ukrainian fight against the Russians and everybody is sort of in their heads, I think says, okay, the Russians are going to crush these guys. And we're all sort of like, yay, the plucky underdog is, is, you know, choking off the the stork as the frog is being eaten, if you will. Um, but I don't think a lot of folks, <laughs> myself included, um, are as familiar with the Ukraine and their history as they probably should be if we're going to, you know, have an intelligent discussion of what's going on or just even a comprehension of what's going on over there and be able to, you know, make your own decisions through that sort of historically educated lens. So I thought perhaps... Yeah, and we if we could... could no, I'm sorry, TC, go ahead. No, 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 I, was, I thought we could discuss that uh, for the edification of your viewership. <clears throat> I think that's absolutely well done. We we really didn't. Uh, Will Wood and I kind of jumped right into it and jumped completely over the hi- long history there. So I want to give also, since we're giving context, uh, if you're just joining me for the first time, somebody shared this with you. My name is Rich Brown, and I am a uh, retired Marine Corps officer, former police officer, corrections officer, special operations officer, regional manager for the disaster preparedness and operations at the Red Cross. And I'm joined this morning by Dr. Fuller. Let me read his, his bio for you this morning. T.C. Fuller is an experienced federal investigator and firearms trainer. He has spent his life carrying a firearm for the United States government. T.C. first served as an Army infantry officer, explosive ordnance disposal officer, before leaving the Army to accept an appointment as special agent for the Federal Bureau of Investigation. He spent the next 20 years working in all areas of investigative interest, within the FBI and served for several years as an instructor at the FBI's firearms training unit in Quantico, Virginia. TC holds a bachelor of science in criminology, as well as a master of education, in interdisciplinary studies and a doctorate. That's right. Ladies and gentlemen, a doctorate in educational leadership and policy studies as a published author. TC has written an innovative book on the topic of improving law enforcement, deadly force training, as well as having written for several print magazines on the areas of law enforcement procedures explosives, firearms, and edge weapons. Among TC's personal achievements, he has been awarded the United States Army's highest peacetime award for heroism, the Soldier's Medal. Besides finding, capturing, and convicting a fugitive on the FBI's 10 most wanted list, TC has also been a successful competitive shooter for more than 20 years, earning a master class certification from IDPA, winning numerous local, state, and regional competitions along the way. He now operates his own company, the Horse Group LLC, which serves as a consultancy on firearms and training, as well as providing high-end private firearms training for both armed professionals and citizens. Please check out TC's amazing website, www.thehorusgroup.net. You'll find a link in today's show notes. So I I wanted to get that out there, TC, so that uh, they know. And again, two self-defense nerds, former law enforcement uh, knuckle draggers in in the... in the infantry for the army and the Marines. And what the hell are we doing talking about Ukraine, man? It's a valid, valid question, Rich. I, I think if you, uh, if you take a good look at my bio, you will note that it does not say Ukrainian specialist, uh, Russian American relations specialist. Uh, it just isn't. I am a student of history as are you, I know. Um, mm-hmm. and I've spent some time over in that part of the world and uh, I can read and I can do research. <laughs> That's one thing yeah. I didn't learn how to do is do research um, because but to answer your question without dancing around it too much, understanding these macro forces at work, I think, puts the context to what we see and are going to see in our own neighborhoods, right? I mean, we have, you know, two nations clashing on the other side of the world, and uh, the president is telling me that that's why I'm paying $4 a gallon for gas, um, which impacts me economically it impacts the people around me economically it impacts the criminal element around me economically um so these sort of macro eco forces that are out there economic forces that are out there could be driving the guy who's breaking down your door or kicking in your window or or trying to take your wallet when you come out of the stop and rob down the street Mm -hmm. Um, so i think having an understanding of these things and being able to make intelligent decisions 
uh, is never a bad thing. You know, an educated populace is a good thing, no matter which side of the political spectrum you're on. Uh, you, you should know these things. You should know what's going on and you should be able to, you know, look at things with an educated and intelligent perspective and make your own decisions and, and feed that into your decision-making paradigm on whatever it is that you're making a par- decision about. Well said. Yeah. Nice Agreed. A hundred percent. Which is why we're going to talk about, uh, you know, again, this is Emerging Threats Monday. We've done shows on losing the power grid. We've done shows on economic collapse. We've done shows on Yellowstone blowing up. Go back and check that one out. That's an interesting one. <laughs> uh, we're well overdue for that uh, that little volcano to go off. Don't want to be anywhere near the Western United States when it does. But anyway, so uh, better armed is better prepared, just like you said, Dr. Fuller. So where do we want to start? Well, let's uh, let's start with an apology for the glare on my glasses. I, uh, I apologize for that, folks. It's, it's beyond my skill set to fix that. So um, listen more than you look, I guess. I do have a face for radio, so uh, apologize. You can always look at me, TC. I'm, that's true. I'm a little eye candy this morning. <laughs> that's why we have you, Rich. I like the plunging neckline. That's a nice touch. Mm, um, yeah. <laughs> is it warm in here? Uh, mm-hmm. All right, so let's talk about the history, right? So everybody's heard of the Ukraine, um, but what what is it? Okay, it's the second largest country in Europe. Uh, it is considered a nation of, of Eastern Europe, and it's number two in landmass right behind Russia. Uh, now, of course, you look at a map and you can see that Russia, in terms of landmass, just dwarfs the Ukraine. Uh, but that doesn't make the Ukraine a small nation. Uh, Alaska is bigger than Montana, but Montana is still a pretty big place, right? <laughs> Same thing is true here. Um, Population-wise, they are number eight uh, in Europe. There's 43 million people in the Ukraine, give or take. Uh, which puts it about population wise, the size of the Sudan or Iraq. All right. For those who've spent some time there, then you compare that with Russia. You know, Russia's talking about 146 ish million people. Um, So it's the largest population in Europe. So it's ninth in the world, Um, about twice the size of Germany, less than half the size of the United States. And for whatever reason in my head, I've always thought of the Russians as being, about on par population wise with the United States, but it simply isn't true. Um, And their economy is about the size of that of South Korea, which I I don't know if that's a compliment to South Korea or an insult to the the Russians, but uh, that's the facts is the facts. Mm -hmm. So if you look at a map, you'll notice that the Ukraine is bounded on East east and the Southeast now and uh, the Northeast by Russia. Right. So it's, from a military perspective, it's sort of the Ukrainian salient, right? It's a, it protrudes and is surrounded on, in essence, three sides by Russia. Uh, I say now because the Southeast was annexed, the Crimea was annexed by the Russians back in 14. Um, we'll talk about that a little more later. It's got Belarus to the north, which is by and large a Russian puppet state at this point. Uh, it's not huge, but it is geographic, geographically significant. And then on the West, and this I think really plays uh, well for the Ukrainians in the long term, they're bordered by uh, Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, then sort of the South and Southwest, you've got Romania and Moldova. And then due South, you've got the Black Sea and a portion of the the Sea of Azov, or Azov, pardon me. If you look at a map, there's a big chunk of water and then there's a small chunk of water just to the East of it. The small chunk of water relative to the big chunk of water is the sea of Azov. Um, All of the countries to the West, by the way, except for Moldova are NATO states. All right. So that, that could be important later on. We'll talk about that some more as well. So back in 91, when, you know, many of us will recall when the Soviet union broke up, one of the many nations to earn its freedom from the USSR was the Ukraine. So the Ukraine became an independent nation in 91 uh, and the Russians just sort of up and left. I mean, I was in Europe when that happened with the military. Um, you could, and I'm sure there are others who were as well. You could go over to East Germany and pay to ride around a T-72 if you wanted to. You could get a flight in a MiG if you wanted to. Uh, the, the point being the military was just, they were starving. They weren't getting paid. They weren't getting fed. Uh, it was kind of a wild time. And, uh, that impacted the Ukraine, right? Because when the Russians left, they left behind about, well, they left a lot of nukes behind and it ended up, the Ukraine ended up with about the third largest nuclear stockpile in the world, which was a fact that I wasn't aware of. I knew they'd left nukes behind. I didn't know they had left 
in essence, a third of their nukes behind, which gave the Ukraine an awful lot of nuclear throw weight, uh, yes. which, which they voluntarily surrendered in 94. Um, they got rid of it on their own. It's the only country in history to ever voluntarily nuclear disarm, disarm themselves from nuclear weapons. Uh, there's some debate whether South Africa may or may not have had them before right. the clerk gave up the country. Yeah. Yeah. They, well, you know, and they were disassembling their tactical nuclear weapons, whether they had strategics or not, mm -hmm. is, is up for debate. Yeah. Which we we may need to tiptoe into today as to explain the difference in those two. Yeah, we do because I think if we see one popped anytime soon, it'll be a tact nuke. But yeah. neither here nor there. Also, a fun fact: when the Russians left, they left behind two and a half million tons of conventional small arms. Yeah. And somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 7 million rifles, pistols, machine guns, mortars. Uh, so when the Ukraine gave up all those nukes, they did not give up those conventional weapons. Smart. So, and didn't they give up those nukes for some sort of security assurance from the West? They did. They uh, Well, not just from the West, but from the Russians as well. They, they gave up. The oh, nukes. really? Yeah. But what they said was, and they, they actually had a treaty with the Russians that said, um, you know, you, that the Russians wouldn't invade. The Russians wouldn't come along and, and you know. 20 years hence come be a problem. And one of their presidents at the time, one of the Ukrainian presidents at the time was really concerned about that. He's like, yeah, I don't know if we can trust the Russians said so publicly mm. and <laughs> uh, smart man. Yeah. How prescient was he? Uh, <clears throat> but if you want to go back even farther, the, the Ukraine was part of the, what's called the Kivian or Kivian. I'm probably butchering that Rus, um, which was a huge loose federation in Eastern and Northern Europe for about 400 years. And it ran, oh, look at you. So it yeah. ran all the way up through Belarus up to the White Sea, which is up mm -hmm. by Finland there, and sort of made a big column coming down to uh, the Black Sea. And it included Belarus, it included parts of Russia, it included the Ukraine. Um, and all three of them have taken, obviously, some of their name or so certainly claim heritage with uh, the Kievan Rus. I'm going to call it the Kievan Rus, and if that offends somebody, I don't care. <laughs> um, so they they ran pretty hard for about 400 years, uh, big trading area, and then with with the with the slide in the Byzantium Empire, the Kievan Rus started to to slide as well, and it, it went through a couple hundred years of just sort of its, its long slow arc, and then uh, the Golden Horde came screaming out of Mongolia in about 1240 and finished it off. So that was the end of the, the, the Rus. So then for about, I don't know, five, 600 years, Ukraine has just fought over constantly. Uh, it's a big plains area, the steeps, the steppes of Russia, the Cossacks that we've all heard of come out of largely out of the Ukraine. Uh, but well, you could see why it's a major, you know, like you said, it's a, it's a bread basket for one. So you'd know why armies would want to take it. Number two, look look at geographically. If you're coming out of the West, I'm sorry, if you're coming out of the East and you want to get to Europe, you almost have to go through, uh, you know, Ukraine. You almost yeah. have to. And, and, you know, the biggest mountain in Ukraine is is like 2,100 meters tall, 2,200 yeah. meters tall. They just don't have mountains. They've got, mm -hmm. they've got a big ridge that runs along sort of the, I wish I had a pointer I could show you, uh, that runs along the... Uh, their eastern border with Russia. Okay. And they've got some hills out to the west. They've got parts of the Carpathian Mountains down near R Romania, uh, but they just don't have any big mountains, which means it's all rolling hills and forest. So that that translates to food and lumber, right? So mm -hmm. um, it, it's a big deal for some of these areas that don't have open plains to grow food for their people. So as a result, various empires, as they grow, are constantly casting their eye on the Ukraine. Uh, they, they get chopped up and absorbed into all kinds of larger political bodies over the years. Uh, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, you know, we, we all sort of in the West think of Poland in unfair derogatory terms a lot of times. I think it's sort of a default setting for some people, given their performance yeah. against the Nazis in World War II, is the best I can tell. But Poland was a badass country for a long time, and they have a rich military history of just clocking all kinds of people. Um, so the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth had parts of it for a while. The Austrian Empire had parts of the Ukraine, the Austria-Hungary Empire, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, they all laid claim to various portions of the Ukraine over the generations until the Tsarist Russians came in and sort of put their boot 
on the neck of the Ukrainians. And that's always been their story, right? They, they mm -hmm. Nobody just comes in and gets them to vote to be part of their country. People try to come in and conquer the Ukrainians, yeah. uh, which translates to the Ukrainians have hundreds of years of military history of fighting invaders. Yeah. This may be important later. <laughs> uh, I, what I, I found a really interesting piece. I thought it was interesting, at least. It, for about 30 years in the late 1650s or late 1600s, about 1660, 1685, somewhere in there, uh, the, the exact dates are debated. But Russia, Poland, uh, the Khanate of Crimea, which was a remnant of, of the Khans, uh, the Cossacks and the Ottoman Empire are all fighting tooth and nail over the Ukraine. And that period of time is referred to simply as the ruin. Which oh, my God. <laughs> I think it tells you everything you need to know about Jeez. just what happened. Um, but it was a huge fight for a long time between a lot of people. Um, and it wasn't, I shouldn't, it wasn't some big monolithic war. It was a lot of small, just nasty fights back and forth, back and forth. So anyhow, the, the, the czars take over. They, they managed to get the Ukraine largely absorbed into uh, Russia. And then 1917 comes along. And so as part of the Russian uh, re revolution, the Ukrainians saw their moment and they leapt. And so they decided, you know, hey, while things are breaking up, we would like to be an autonomous zone with our own rules, laws, basically everything but it, our own country and name in everything but name. And the Russians took umbrage to the Soviet, the new Soviets took um, umbrage to that. A lot of people in the West don't hear about this war because it's, the Russians refer to it as the Southern front of the Russian civil war. Um, mm. The Ukrainians refer to it as the, their war of independence. Um, so it goes on for, like I said, about four years and it gets really, really nasty. And here they are, the Ukrainians fighting the Russians again. Uh, and they lost and their parts of their country was taken in by Russia, parts by Poland, Romania, Czechoslovakia. So once again, the Ukrainians get chopped up and divvied up. I'm going to have to read about that. Cause I, I'm actually not aware of that because it where was it in the broader context of World War One? Do you know? I believe they had troops in World War One, um, but they had a very strong nationalist movement before 1917, and then of course everybody was very dissatisfied about how things were being done in World War One in, in Russia. Oh yeah, uh, and the, and the Ukrainians were no different. But they also, again, they saw their moment to strike when you know Russia was pulling out and they were in turmoil. So they thought, hey, you know, now's the time. We got to go. Now's the go. time. That's it. And uh, <clears throat> even though they lost, they ended up with a very strong nationalist movement in the 20s and 30s um, in both Poland and the Ukraine or and Russia, because obviously Poland still had chunks of the Ukraine. And that that dipped into violence on occasion as well. So then, as you know, the Russians understand that or the Soviets at this point understand that the Ukrainians aren't pleased about being part of the country. So they kind of feel like they need to bring them to heel. And they did a very much in my mind, an uncharacteristic sort of response. They, they did a carrot and a stick thing. They, they allowed them to have Ukrainian <clears throat> traditions and cultures. They didn't just rub them out like they did in so many other places. Um, but at the same time, they, they forced them into collectivization. They, uh, they created what they call the Holdemore famine, which was, oh. you know, the same sort of idea that, that Mao would use years later, uh, you know, famine as a, as a political tool. Mm -hmm. uh, as a as a punishment tool, so they deliberately inflicted a, a famine on them. It's a pretty powerful tool. <laughs> it works, yeah. Like we've said very many times on this show, people get mean when their kids get hungry. Damn um, right they do. And uh, so they, they starved them out. And then, of course, everybody under the Soviet heel, as well as the Ukrainians, uh, had to survive through the Great Terror, the purges that that kind of descended around 1937. So, despite all of that. Um, the, the Ukrainians fought for largely fought for the Russians in World War II. So the Nazis roll in. I think many of us have heard the stories about how the Ukrainians originally looked at the Nazis as liberators. Uh -huh. um, some did. Some did, particularly out in the West, um, where they really didn't like the Poles all that much because the Poles had lopped off part of their country. Um, <clears throat> but when the Nazis and the Russians chopped up Poland, those Ukrainian areas returned to the USSR's control and, and were attached back to it. I was going to say it was only for a relative yeah. brief period of time before they figured out the Nazis were not their friends. Right. So then the Nazis in Operation Barbarossa roll over the Soviet border and they get into uh, the Ukraine as part of that deal. And uh, 
you know, one of the many, many missed opportunities uh, that the Nazis had here was they could have turned a lot of these Ukrainians around and fought the Russians with them, but they didn't. And they pissed them off. And <laughs> it's at this point, you should be starting to pick up on the fact that once you've angered the Ukrainians, there's really no going back, right? <laughs> they, they get upset and they stay that way. Um, so you end up with uh, between four and a half and seven million Ukrainians end up fighting for the Russians. Um, wow. Yeah. Uh, when the Russians were defending Kiev, when the Germans first attacked, they, they ended up losing somewhere in the neighborhood of a half a million men dead Good trying God. to take Kiev. Yeah, I mean, it was the numbers are just astronomical on that whole front. But uh, the Germans eventually did take Kiev and occupied it from September 41 to November 43. And uh, it was never a pleasant experience for them. You ended up with a lot, a lot of Ukrainian guerrillas. Um, and again, this is, I think, is relevant to today's problems that the Russians oh, yeah. face. And it amazes me that the Russians don't remember this or they're just ignoring it or, you know, like so many people say these days, well, it wasn't done right then. We're doing it. We're going to do it the right way. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah. When the Ukraine actually fell to the Nazis, there was estimated to be about 50,000 guerrillas on the ground. You know, that's, you know, when you conquer an area, it's not like you're grabbing every guy individually and, and vetting him and deciding what to do with him, right? Mm -hmm. You're punching down the roads. Well, if I don't want to be a, a prisoner of the Nazis, I just run into the woods, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, maybe they catch me, maybe they don't. So you got 50,000 of these guys running around. Um, by 1944, there was roughly half a million. Wow. And about 50%, roughly roughly 50% were actual Ukrainians. There's there's a bunch of Russians there too, because, you know, a Russian division or a Russian army corps gets surrounded and obliterated is what we'll read in the history books. Well, that doesn't mean killed to the last man. It means a bunch were captured, a bunch were killed, and a bunch got away and went out to the woods. Well, I'll, I'll, let me ask you a question. So if I remember correctly, you know, you have the, the Germans pull in, they fight this protracted gruesome fight in Stalingrad. Does that mean that they're on the road back? The supply trains were getting hit. The Germans were by these uh, partisan fighters in the Ukraine or am I misinterpreting that? Yeah. I, you had a, a significant problem with guerrillas in the rear areas throughout oh the Russian attack or throughout the Russian campaign, but they were just brutal on these overextended supply lines. Mm. I mean, the, the Germans had massive supply lines and they they did a very, in my imagination, my perception, they did a poor job of creating supply points and defending those supply points along the way. They were hyper dependent on the rails. And of course, the Russian rails had a different gauge than the German rails. So they had to you know, switch that up. They thought they were going to, the Germans thought they were going to roll in and just capture a bunch of Russian rolling stock. Uh, and then they could just use that. Well, of course, that didn't happen. The Russians were very good about destroying and taking these things. But then once the guerrillas got going, um, they just wreaked havoc on the rear areas. You know, they when the Russians went back to recapture, oh, God, what was it? Um, when they're going back towards the, the Dnieper River and they're trying to get back across, for a couple of months in 43, you had uh, what they called the, the rail war, the war of the rails. And you had something like 95, 96,000 uh, Ukrainian, largely Ukrainian guerrilla fighters attacking the railroads, right? They were just blowing up the trains. They were blowing up the rails and they cut the rails in German or in the German controlled rails in Ukraine 200,000 times in two months. Oh my God. I mean, <laughs> 200,000 times. Right. Now imagine the impact that has on an already overextended line of supply, right? Your lines of communications are just getting crushed. Yeah. And that doesn't count, you know, ambushing ambulances that are driving down the road or, you know, zapping a couple of trucks that are cruising down the road or, you know, shooting up some airplanes on a, on a tarmac. I mean, and that's going on all the time. Well, I was going to say, you know, you, you cut a rail line and then you put an, make it an ambush point. And when you come up to fix the rail line, right. You shoot those guys, and now who wants to get out and repair the rail line? Right. Because you're going to get shot in the head. Right. Or you oh, just booby trap it. Or you yeah, cut exactly. it here, and you go 300 yards down the road, and you cut it again. That's exactly right. You go another right. 100 yards down the road, and you cut it again. Um, well, it's like maddening. Said, right. And you don't even have to do a full-on ambush. Just put a sniper out there. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, the Russians were big on snipers. Um, so there's just all kinds of ways to just make people's lives miserable, and that's exactly what they did. 
Uh, and that, of course, then forces the Germans to defend those supply lines, and it forces Germans to take units out of the main battle line and put them back doing anti-partisan work. And, of course, the Germans being Germans, the Nazis being Nazis, they they overcompensated in terms of anti-partisan warfare. And I... And you create more partisans because you create more partisans, right? That's right. I mean, it, and that, that's a common story throughout sort of the counterinsurgency warfare. It's it's more of a human condition than a Nazi condition. Yeah, exactly. Look at a, Afghanistan and Iraq, wherever you want to go. Yeah. We're good at it too, right, TC? Yeah, yeah we've had our, our moments, that's for sure. Um, but, you know, you end up with about eight and a half million Red Army soldiers are killed in World War II. And 1.4 million of those were ethnic Ukrainians. Holy cow. So they, they ponied up. And, and what's worse is 40% of the total losses by the USSR in World War II, that's civilian, military, everybody, 40% were Ukrainians. Well, so, if you think about that, TC, I, I'm, so right now Ukraine's population is what? About 40 million, I think you said? About 43, yeah. And so in the 40s, you probably had half that number, maybe 20 million. And, and I'm imagining 1.4 million, I mean, five percent of your population killed in, in just a few years of world war ii that's that's well, not just your soldiers right exactly just your soldiers yeah oh, jesus uh, yeah and of course we all know that the, the civilians get hit a lot harder than soldiers in wars yes so then on top of all this you know the ukraine is just wrecked i read somewhere it was something like twenty-eight thousand villages and almost a thousand cities were just destroyed in the ukraine um during world war ii now think about that put that in the united states Pick a thousand cities and destroy them in the United States. Any any thousand. Yeah. I mean, what does that do? To, you know, it's crazy. Well, then on top of so the, the Russians, the Soviet Union recognized afterwards, hey, we got to put some money into this and fix this. This is a this is a mess. Well, then in, in 46 and 47, they got hit by another famine. Because oh <laughs> you know, when it rains, it pours, right? Yeah. Um, but that being said, by the mid-50s, the Ukrainian economy had largely recovered. Um, they were back on their feet. And, uh, you know, they staggered along. They did some really incredible things for uh, the Soviet Union, you know, for a long time. And then in 91, they were freed. Uh, they, they escaped, however you want to put it. But they were out on their own. And, of course, right away, what happens? Their economy tanks. Right? They, just, mm. they hit five-digit uh, or five-figure inflation at some points. Their GDP gets cut in half. Uh, I mean, it just it gets gutted. But by 2000, within 10 years, they're back on their feet. Their economy's growing at about 7% a year, which is a, a healthy economy by anybody's marker. Um, what accounted for that turnaround? Was it their, the wheat and grain exports, uh, energy sector? Do you know, TC? I, I couldn't speak to that as well as you and, and Will could. I'm sure mm -hmm. if Will put his mind to it, he could figure it out. Uh, but I will say that they are rich in food. Right. Uh -huh. I mean, they, yep. they were the, the breadbasket for Russia for a long time. They have um, some very, very capable uh, um, uranium mines. So they, they have some of the richest uranium in the world. Uh, so they, germanium, they have, gallium, a lot yeah, of things. They have, are... they have these things. They have yeah. natural resources in abundance. And again, it's not like it's under a mountain. Right. Uh, it's, it's relatively easy to get to this stuff. Um. So they are out there and they're, they're, they're churning it out. And, and I, I put a big part of it down to just the work ethic of the Ukrainians, mm -hmm. you know, they having these things, there are plenty of places in Africa that have these things that have horrible economies and have traditionally had horrible economies. No. Um, these guys had these things and they put their noses to the grindstone and they fixed it and they do it over and over and over again. When you look through their history, they just get decimated by warfare. They stand up and get back to work. They get decimated by another war. They stand up and get back to work. Um, and it breeds know, a hearty set of people, you know, it does. And, and a, a set of people who are more than willing, although not happy about it, but they will put down their, their plowshares and they will pick up the sword when pushed. Yeah. And, and that's not a good thing for anybody involved. And then when it's over, it's over and they go back to work. Um, so you kind of have to respect that, I think. Oh, hundred percent. But they, they've always had a, a problem with uh, crime and corruption in their governments. You know, I think Zelensky's their third or fourth president. And of the first two, they, they ended up with corruption charges. And uh, one of them, you know, they were always flirting with, do we want to be friends with the West? Do we want to be friends with the Russians? They're walking a tightrope. And I, you can understand why. I mean, the Russian is the 500 pound gorilla in the living room, right? So they got to yeah. kind of deal with him. Uh, 
but one of their presidents like disappeared. They couldn't find him. It was president or prime minister. They, he just vanished. They're like, where the hell is he? And the next thing you know, he, he shows up in Russia. He's abandoned his post and he's talking about, hey, we need to reunify with Russia. And uh, you know, everybody's kind of scratching their head. They're like, well, okay, fire his ass, get somebody else in here. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and corruption has been a big problem. And that, that has actually been uh, one of the hindrances to them getting into NATO. Well, and I think the the uh, reading the uh, the laptop from hell, you know, uh, it doesn't appear that the uh, current administration did them any favors. Looks like they really lean into that corruption, and at least Hunter made himself uh, quite wealthy. Yeah, and that's you know obviously an entire topic for a different show, probably with a a better educated guest than I on that particular topic. But yeah, uh, yeah just not 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 an unusual behavior. Yeah. In their defense, I will say in the last 10 or 15 years, they've started to knuckle down on the corruption. Uh, Mm -hmm. And Zelensky has a reputation for having been uh, largely anti-corruption as well. Uh, So they're, they're making the effort and they, uh, in 2019, they, they amended their constitution and they, they enshrine in sort of their, in what they call the basic law, the ideas and the standards that need to be inculcated in their society and propagated in their society for EU membership and NATO membership. <clears throat> so right in their constitution is basically them saying, we're, we're going to be a member of EU and we're going to be a member of NATO. Oh, really? I did not know right. that. So, mm-hmm. and again, this is, we kind of say, oh, well, Putin is just coming off the top rope, you know, on this for no good reason. Well, from his perspective, and I'm not saying his is a correct perspective or a good perspective, but from his perspective, this is a concern, right? Because the guy's got an almost pathological fear of the spread of democracy. And now here it is, the country right next door. The, he's aware of all the facts we've already discussed about the Ukraine. And they're, they're in essence, telling him, look, we're going to join the EU and we're going to join NATO because we don't like it. Um, yeah. So anyhow, in 2014... Uh, the Russians come up with a reason to annex the Crimea. They, they basically they roll into the Crimea, which is a little peninsula. That if you look at again, if you look at a map, it sticks down between the Black Sea and the uh, and the Sea of Azov. It's that little southern, almost an island down below the E in Ukraine there, right above the words Black Sea. Mm-hmm. So in 2014, the Russians roll in there and they quick like a bunny rabbit have a referendum that's <laughs> organized in and run by the Russian military. And what do you know, the people of the Crimea vote to become part of Russia. Uh, and that, and that, that took a lot of their Navy, didn't it? Because that's yeah. where a lot of the Ukrainian Navy was in the black sea, right? Yeah. Yeah. And a matter of fact, we'll talk about force comparison here in a second and we'll, we'll mm. kind of talk about that, but yeah, it really gutted their Navy. Mm. Um, the U S and the EU, by the way, denounced that, that referendum is illegal and, and decided they weren't going to abide by it. Oddly enough, China has never recognized the uh, annexation of the Crimea by Russia either. I did not know that. Yeah, which is, a, um, you know, just kind of another reflection of just how complicated this gets. So 2014 also saw the beginning of the ongoing war in Donbass. Uh, and that's sort of the, the two breakaway republics, the Donetsk and Lugansk. I'm, again, I'm probably butchering those. My Russian is non-existent. Uh, but the two breakaway republic areas uh, in Eastern Ukraine. And that's been a hot war. Uh, they've been shooting at each other over there. Um, you know, the Russians are funding and supporting the separatists. I, I, it'd be foolish to suggest they didn't have special forces on the ground there. I'm sure they do, mm-hmm. but the Ukrainian military has been getting combat experience fighting out there. So they've actually been over there fighting. You know, what's amazing to me, TC, is that, uh, here we are 2022, 20, right. And, and, up until the hot war, we had this weird sort of trench warfare going on out there. I mean, it's, it looks like 1918 all over again. Yeah. It's unbelievable. And, and you know, we forget the Russians. We've all been, especially guys, our generation brought up with, Oh, the big scary Russian bear, right? They're, they're, mm-hmm. I think we've overestimated their military capability, but the Russians haven't fought a ground war, conventional war since world war II. I mean, yeah, they've had a dust up with Georgia. They've had these little insurgency, counterinsurgency wars, uh, even in Afghanistan. That was all that was, was a counterinsurgency. I mean, they took the country in hours. 
but then they spent 20 years fighting a, or 10 years fighting a, a, a counterinsurgency in yeah. Chechnya. Nobody seems to do it well these days. Yeah. Right. I think the only, I've read the only ones that ever won a, a counterinsurgency was the British in, in Kenya. Right. Yeah. And, and of course that was just before CNN and yeah. cell phones and, uh, you know, so you can do a lot of things and control the narrative about what was getting out of there. Um, but yeah, so the Russians don't have a lot of experience fighting and honest to God, get in there with your conventional troops and fight a war. And I think we're seeing that play out here a bit. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, I think. So anyhow, um, the Crimea gets pulled into Russia. You've got these breakaway republics. Um, you've got the Ukrainians moving closer and closer to the West. Uh, in April of 2019, I think this is relevant. You've got, oh, looky there. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to show you the Donbass uh, yeah, since you were talking about TC. That's it, right there. Um, in 2018, April of 2018, Zelensky gets elected president, the current president of Ukraine. And he's been unabashedly pursuing closer ties with the West, which, of course, perforce means more distance from Russia. But you've got this, this breakaway republic in the Donbass, and that's what Putin has used largely to uh, justify his invasion now. That and saying that you know Zelensky and his government are Nazis and, uh, I don't know, whatever else he can make up. He's sort of thrown that out there. But isn't this a slicing off? I mean, it, it's... It it seems like he was piecemeal in the country. Sure. First Crimea, then the Donbass, and, and he was just going to continue to sliver it. And they finally said, ah, you know what? <laughs> I'm going all in, pushing all my chips in here. Yeah. And you know what? Had he done this, it, it probably would have continued to work. I mean, we weren't going to go to war over the Donbass. Uh -uh. Um, you know, it would have been more appeasement, right? Oh, it's just the Sudetenland. Who cares? Yeah. Right. Oh, it's just the Lorraine Valley. Who cares? Uh -huh. um, but the whole Ukraine, he decided, like you said, he decided to go uh, all in, and that's a problem. Yeah, that's a problem. All right, so you know, when we see Russia invade the Ukraine, right away we go, oh, God, look at the, the, the disparity in force. Look at the troop differences. Uh, so let's talk about that for a bit. Okay, we, we all kind of intellectually think to ourselves, yes, we know that Russia is bigger than the Ukraine, but what, what do the numbers show us? Yeah. So you've got a Russian military of about an active military, about 850,000 TC. I'm going to try to throw this up there uh, since we're playing with slides here. If I may, right. you can go ahead and keep talking to it. I'll go ahead and prepare it for you. But they've got another 2 million of what we would consider reserve troops, paramilitaries, border guards. You know, so they have a lot of, a lot of bodies, right? So close to 3 million that they can put in the field immediately if they had to. Uh, versus the Ukraine with a standing army of about 200, standing military of about 200,000. So you're looking at, I don't know, five, six, 10 times, whatever it is there. It's, it's crazy in, in terms of troop numbers. Um, when you talk about, I should be, let me rephrase the Russians. I, the paramilitaries are not counted in that. It's just their, their various armed uh, border guards, internal security and military. Paramilitary guys, and that encompasses some of those forces as well. I was a little... Uh, hard pressed to figure out exactly where the line was between paramilitary and, and military in the Russian rubric, but there it's still about a quarter million. Just paramilitary. yeah, does police factor into paramilitary? Do you know? Well, and that's a good question. It, it's going to probably at least be the paramilitaries. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think they count them. But then they've got the border guards, and the border guards don't fall under the military because that's just falling back to the old Soviet way of looking at things. Um, so this gives you an, an idea. Now, of course, some of these numbers, you know, take them with a grain of salt, right? Because we're relying upon other governments to provide them. And I've gotten them from various sources that didn't agree with each other. So I've kind of distilled them into what you're looking at here. Uh, the Ukrainians are about 50,000. But that, that paramilitary number is probably skyrocketed at this point because you've got every able-bodied man in Ukraine is now being encouraged to pick up a gun. And a lot of women, too. And a lot of women, yeah. yeah. Um, naval vessels, you know, this is just so lopsided, it's hard to even fathom. Uh, they started out with 38 ships, right? Well, the Ukraine only has a presence in the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov, and less so in the Sea of Azov since this started. You know, they're, they're largely concerned with guarding the Black Sea. The Russians have a worldwide naval presence. So when you see that they have, you know, 605 ships, that, that shouldn't surprise anyone some of those 605 ships by the way were the ukrainians mm -hmm. um aircraft the numbers are huge hugely different uh so i i sussed out the fighter numbers 
So you've got 318 aircraft in the Ukraine, of which about 69 at the beginning of the war were fighters. I don't understand how Russia has not had complete air supremacy from day one. You know, it's a valid question, but I will tell you, neither side, I, I don't expect either side to come up with air supremacy simply because they both have stupid amounts of anti-aircraft capability. Mm. Uh, and especially now we're pumping in all kinds of, you know, man pad, SAM launchers to the Ukrainians, mm -hmm. right? Everybody. And it's not just us, right? I mean, everybody is giving them anti-tank oh, yeah. weaponry Germans, yeah. and anti-aircraft weaponry. Um, and, you know, I, I've read a couple articles that said, look, when the Russians roll in, they're going to have, you know, wherever their, their mass attack is, wherever their main attack is, is going to be some of the deadliest airspace in the world because the Russians take that stuff seriously. And they do. I mean, they, they have all kinds of anti-aircraft capability and they're not afraid to use it. Um, so you've got the aircraft, but you know, their aircraft still flying on both sides. Um, yeah. But I think we're going to, just like we saw in Afghanistan, 270 Soviet planes were put down in what less than three years. Yeah. Once, once our stinger yeah. showed up on the scene. So, and when I flew into uh, Kabul airport back in the day, just as an interesting aside, there were still wrecked MIGs on the, out in the, you know, kind of in the grass between the runways. Really? And when you, for those who have flown in and out of Kabul will know that it's surrounded by hills and mountains, uh, which is a perfect place to set up a SAM when somebody is trying to land an aircraft, you know, they're going low and slow and getting lower and slower. And there's no way to dodge when mm -hmm. that missile comes in. Well, you know, the, the Russians are going to find that out too. Of course, the Russians can fly in out of their own bases uh, until they get out West or out of Belarus. So I think you're right. I think you're going to see, aircraft getting splashed on both sides for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, helicopters, the disparity continues, right? You're talking about more than 10 times the number of helicopters, uh, what, 15, 20 times as many attack helicopters. Mm -hmm. uh, armored vehicles, we're talking about three different ty three times as many for the Russians. Uh, and we're talking about, you know, your BTRs, your BMPs, your, your basically your armored personnel carriers. And then, of course, tanks. Everybody likes to, you know, count gun barrels on tanks and you've got something like five or six times as many tanks in the Russian military as you do in the Ukrainian military. Now are uh, those T-72 against T-72 or the Ukrainians using the same the Soviet Ukrainian, tanks? Yeah, they're using Soviet tanks at least at this point. Um, but the Soviet tanks have largely been modernized as have the, the uh, Ukrainian tanks, but the Ukrainian tanks, you know, their best tank is a T-72 that's been up armored and, and upgraded. Um, the yeah. Soviet tanks are, you know, T eighties, T nineties. Um, so they are more modern and they've also been upgraded. I hate to, uh, this is such Johnny, I think is asking the question that I want to know. And I don't know if you know, Dr. Fuller, he says, do you think Russia's dismal performance makes the nuclear threat more credible? And when we talk nuclear, I think it's important to distinguish between tactical and strategic uh, yes, I, I do. Um, yeah. I, I think that, uh, you know, we can, I was going to talk about that in a little while, but a tactical well, nuke, obviously. You want to hold on to it? Yeah, we can hold on to it if you, if okay. you want to. Okay, let's um, hold on to that question. Johnny, that's a good question, though. It's a very good question. Yeah, yeah very I like good. your segue. Uh, so as you pointed out earlier, Rich, the, the Navy got, was gutted. The Ukrainian Navy was gutted in 2014. Their headquarters was captured. Most of their ships were captured because they were headquartered out of the Crimea. Their Navy was. Mm -hmm. uh, several of their high-ranking officers, including admirals, uh, defected to Russia. Uh, the Ukrainian response is kind of like, look, we've been meaning to upgrade our Navy, uh, and they have been trying to, but of course, it's it's at this point, it's it's a Sisyphusian problem. They're just not yeah. going to get that boulder up the But did they defect or did they defect? <laughs> well, that's, that's always the question when the Russians are involved, right? But, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, Who, who's to say? And I certainly don't know. Uh, valid question, though. The Air Force, the, the Ukrainian Air Force has been shrinking and modernizing. They've been trying to like, streamline their bureaucracy and, and modernize their aircraft. They've been moving hard into drones. They've recognized that that's uh, you know, a, a, an area where they can compete because they, they're cheaper, right? <laughs> At one point, they tried to, to mm -hmm. like, go fund me a drone project. They tried to crowdsource a, a, a drone, which I thought was brilliant. Uh, and eventually, interesting. Yeah, right? Um, that some students in the Western Ukraine ended up designing a, uh, a very effective drone for about four grand 
uh, they can build them and they've actually been absorbed into the uh, Ukrainian military. They're building these things off the shelf parts and they can broadcast footage live. So you're starting to see wow. a lot more uh, live footage from these drones. And I, I think we can all agree that the Ukrainians are winning the, the worldwide propaganda war. Uh, and in part because of this. Uh, and I think we've, I read somewhere, TC, that I think the Marine Corps has, well, the U.S., but it's a Marine Corps uh, weapon system, the, the switchblade drone, mm-hmm. uh, which is an amazing piece of equipment. It's it's a suicide, one of those suicide drones that just bang, you know. And, yeah, and the Russians are apparently using them as well. They're, you know, they got a wingspan of a meter, meter and a half, something like probably. that, about three or four kilograms of explosive, which doesn't sound a lot. But as a former EOD guy, I can tell you that the, the amount of explosive in a hand grenade is measured in grams. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when you're when you're dropping three or four kilograms of explosive, it's it, you can kill a tank with that easily, um, as well as troops and everything else. So yeah, they're they're nasty little things, and I think drones are we're going to see more and more of them. Uh, but the bottom line there is the, the Ukrainian effort to modernize their air force exists. It's just been slow. Mm-hmm. You know, the ground forces on both sides, they both come from sort of a Soviet perspective. So they're both very artillery heavy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's not reflected in this chart, but what you see is uh, a very artillery centric approach. Um, before the war started, the Ukrainians had, for example, 13 mechanized infantry brigades and two armor brigades, but they had seven rocket and artillery brigades. So. Wow. That gives you an idea of just how dependent on the artillery they are. And I think what you're going to start seeing is as the Ukrainians continue to stymie the Russians, as they continue to slow them down, as they continue to, you know, mount the casualty figures, the Russians are going to do what they always have done uh, and most recently did in Grozny is they'll start to surround things. I think this is what's going to happen to Kiev. They're going to surround Kiev and then they're just going to rubble it. You know, they're just going to start in with the artillery barrages and it's just going to be bad. I don't, I don't, I mean, I can't believe we're we're still doing that kind of warfare in 2022. I mean, that's just, yeah, just artillery barrage a city into rubble. I mean, uh, my God. And, and I think the only thing that's kept them from doing it so far is that it's going to be splashed all over the world. You know, the the Russians have always been very good at controlling that narrative out of a war zone. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I mean, even in, in Chechnya, there was a lot of information coming out of there from the Chechens, but it didn't get a whole lot of mainstream play. So they were able to, you know, if there was a sniper on a, on a apartment block, they would say, well, we're not going to go in there and get the sniper. We'll just flatten the apartment block. Uh, and that's, you know, like you said, here we are in 2022 and we're still doing that kind of thing. And we're all paying attention to Kiev and to a certain point Lviv. Uh, we're not looking at some of these little villages out in the hinterland. Um, and you roll up a, a regimental artillery group of one five twos and, and unload them on a village. It's not going to be a whole lot left. You know, mm. it's not these modern weapons are humans are, are very good at killing one another. And they oh, yeah. seem to be at their best when they're figuring out ways to kill each other. I think it's real important though, when we're talking about these numbers, when we look at these charts to understand that when you count force between a force disparity between militaries, it's easy to count tanks. Right. And you look at the tank numbers and you go, oh, geez, well, you know, Russians got a lot more tanks. They're obviously going to win. Uh, it's easy to count bodies. It's easy to count guns, but it doesn't tell the whole story. Uh, and I, I would argue it doesn't even necessarily tell an accurate story uh, because any professional military person will tell you that, you know, the old adage, right? Uh, amateurs talk tactics, professionals talk logistics. Uh, you've exactly got to be right. able to keep these things in the field. You've got to be able to keep them moving. And that depends on logistics and a logistics system. And those are critical. And we're already seeing cracks in the Russian logistics system, right? I mean, how many pictures of tanks have you seen abandoned because they're out of gas? I couldn't believe that, man. That 40 mile column of, of tanks and armor. I'm like, why are they waiting? Why are they waiting? Day after day, they're just sitting there. And I'm like, the American military would just run through that. It'd be the highway of death in Iraq, 1991, all over right. again. Uh, there, is, there is security in speed, right? So if you're moving, you're harder to, to pin down. And that's true of individuals, and that's true of Army groups. But it, wasn't it because they couldn't get them resupplied, TC? That's why they kept sitting there for a week yeah. or so? I mean, then, you know, military vehicles are good at a lot of things. Gas mileage is not one of them. Yep. Um and, and keeping things fueled is tough. I mean, naval forces used to be, 
be very constrained by coal, right? They had to have coaling stations. The British Empire set up coaling stations all over the world to feed their um, ships because they had to stop and get coal, uh, stop and get oil. That's one of the big things, big benefits of a nuclear reactor on a ship. You don't have to go to port for fuel. Uh, the same is true of trucks and tanks. You can have the best tank in the world, but if it can't move, it's a pillbox. And once it runs out of ammo, you got to get more ammo. Um, you know, America won World War II or helped win World War II for a lot of reasons, but the biggest one was our logistics. Yeah, and I, I learned this kind of the hard way. I was having a conversation with uh, my one of my commanding officers in the Marine Corps. His name is Colonel Mike Ohl, and he was the uh, a tank battalion commander, one of the guys that led the Thunder Run into Baghdad. And he would tell us officers about his his officers and staff, non commissioned officers, just getting shot to pieces. And I'm like, sir, I don't understand. You're you're in an M1 Abrams tank. What are you? How are they getting physically shot through the head and face? He's like, Rich, you got to refuel these things, which means you got to come out of the tank, or you got to get the extra box of 50 cal ammo or 762 off the side of it and take it. And when you come out of that tank, you're getting hit. Yeah. So just to your point, TC, yeah. And, and every military unit I was ever in practiced refueling. We practiced hot refueling. The Bradleys, we'd roll in and, and and how to refuel in a combat zone. They do it for helicopters all the time, right? They'll set up the FARPs and they'll fly out there and they'll, they'll run these hot refuels. Uh, the Air Force is constantly practicing refueling in the air uh, because it's important. I mean, the Americans, we've always been, you know, sort of a military power, at least since the 1800s. But the big thing we bring to the field that people don't want to talk about because it's not glamorous and it doesn't, you know, get the, the nobody's making movies about the quartermaster corps. Uh, but it's because of our, our logistical strength. I mean, 100%. I remember coming home from the Gulf and I, my, my wife offered me some M&Ms at one point. And I'm like, if I have to eat another m and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose my mind because we had pallets of them. Mm-hmm. You know, in Afghanistan, I, I I stood and watched the C-5 land one day because it's C-5, right? It's a huge plane. I'm like, ooh, ooh big plane. And uh, it pulls up and I'm talking to, you know, one of the Air Force guys. There, and I said, so what's on this? I'm thinking ammo. I'm thinking, you know, he's like, oh, it's Gatorade. Mm-hmm. I said, what? He, that that freaking nose opened up. And I don't know if you've ever seen a C-5, you know, top to bottom, left to right, front to back, full of Gatorade. But I've seen it. And he says, yeah, we're getting two of these a week. Damn. I'm like, Two of these a week. So we not only are we getting crazy amounts of Gatorade, but we have the lift capacity to keep everything else going that we actually need to fight a war and still get Private Snuffy his grape Gatorade. And guess what? We still got our ass kicked and ran off. <laughs> well, yeah, but not the troops. The troops didn't get their ass kicked. No, they did not. And they certainly weren't dehydrated. That's exactly um, right. But it's the logistics trains that wins wars. Yes, you know, and you can have the numbers and still lose. You uh, you look at World War II, all right? So the Germans blitz into Poland. Well, had the French decided, okay, we're going to go, they would have gone to Berlin and no one could have stopped them. They had a 5 million man military at the outset of World War II. They had uh, some of the best gear, some of the best weaponry, some of the best tanks, and they had more of it. It was the biggest military in Europe. And that was a big concern of the German high command. It's like, look, if we turn, if we go all in over in Poland, you know, if the French roll, we got a problem. And and if had the French roll, they would have made it all the way to Berlin and been unstopped. And we don't talk about that because of their generally lackluster performance. But that that's the fact. And they sat. And it, there's an argument to be made that look, they 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 absorbed the brunt of World War One. They weren't anxious to get into another knockdown drag out with the Germans. So they sat and waited behind the Maginot. How'd that work out? Didn't work out because the Germans <laughs> turned around, obviously. And the Maginot Line worked, right? It, it kept the Germans from coming through the Maginot Line. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it forced them to go through one of two places. Well, the French thought they wouldn't come through the lowlands like they always do. Um, but, the, you know, what ends up happening there is the French sat for so long that their, their will to fight was really sapped. And the Germans hit France with 135 divisions, only 16 of which were mechanized. Right. It hmm. wasn't a huge mechanism. I mean, the rest of them was horse drawn military and they spent the most, the majority of the war with a horse drawn military. Uh, and they, and they won, even though they were grossly outnumbered, but they had the will to fight. And that's just one example. History is replete with them. Hell, the United States Marine Corps punches in 
insanely above its weight mm -hmm. uh, for its numbers. And they're you and it's axiomatic that they're using old throwaway army gear to do it, right? True, true. Yeah. And why is that? Well, that's largely due to a spree. Mm -hmm. I mean, and we've talked about this before. I was obviously not a Marine, but they beat that esprit into you guys from day one. I can say yellow footprints to anybody who's been in the Marine Corps and they smile and they go, Oh yeah, yellow footprints, right? And it's yeah. a big deal to get that EGA at the end. Well, that's how you get a 19-year-old private to look at an 18-year-old private. And say, look, you gotta go take that K bar and charge that machine gun nest and kill all those Japanese guys. And he goes, okay, and mm -hmm. he does it. Um, you know that that's that a spree counts for an awful, awful lot. And I don't think we're seeing the logistics by the Russians that they need, and we're not seeing the esprit on the part of their soldiers that we need or that they need or that we need. Um, and that is well, it goes back to the propaganda thing too, as far as like I don't know what. Putin may have told those troops before they went in. And I think Link, Lincoln had this problem with getting uh, Union troops to invade the South and try to bring them to Hill. And then, you know, that's what led to the Emancipation Proclamation and put, putting a moral spin on the war. Uh, and, and, of course, now the Union troops can go like, wait, I'm, I'm here to liberate these enslaved people. And now I have a moral dimension and my elan and a spree just goes through the roof. So to your point, TC, I don't know what Putin's messaging was to his troops. Do you? No, I don't. But it no. seems like it's been ineffective because yeah, you're yeah. seeing what is purported to be Russian POWs making videos, news, you know, asking for news conferences and telling people, look, that we weren't told the truth about what was going on here. The fact that you're taking all of your soldiers' cell phones away before mm -hmm. you roll them across the border says an awful lot. Uh -huh. it, it says to me, what you're doing is something that you don't want people to know about. Yeah. You don't want people back home knowing about this fight. So the idea that you're fighting a just war, it, it starts to fade in that. But again, he controls the, the narrative within his own borders. Um, you know, so what but is that? To the, but only to the extent with which he can control the Internet. And I think that's where China really wins out. And I, I bet Putin wishes he had the control over the Internet that Z does. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Or that North Korea has. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Uh, and I think he's going to suffer as a result of it. I mean, he's already got unprecedented amounts of anti-war protests. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you were a kid, would you have ever thought the Russians would experience an anti-war protest? No. I certainly didn't. I mean, that was, that was not something that the Russians did. Um, but yet here they are. And, and it leads to, I think it segues nicely into a question, of why invade this? Why do this in the first place? Right. What is the desired end state? What are you trying to do? The, like Koswitz would say, military action is, and I'm paraphrasing here, but military action is politics by another means. That's right. Right. So you're trying to achieve a political goal with this military force. Well, what is that? Um, I mean, Russia has a long stated desire for, you know, land between itself and NATO. After two wars that were so costly to them in, in the last century, I, we, I think we can all get that, that they, they just don't trust people in the West. They, like, look, we want to put a bunch of land between you and us. Uh, and in this case, between them and NATO. Yeah, the ROI on this, TC, just doesn't seem to be there. You know what I mean? I'm like, I don't. The risk versus reward, ROI, whatever you want to put it, like the calculus is weird to me. So I'm interested to hear what you think he had to gain here. Yeah, and, and I, I will write a bottom line up front. I'm not 100%. I'm not sure. I'm not sure yeah. anybody knows. Maybe somebody at the White House knows. I don't know. We like to think that, but who's, who's to say? Um, but they clearly see NATO as a strategic threat. You know, we see NATO as a defensive shield. They see it as, you know, a group, a, a street gang looking to come take their stuff. Um and in fairness, can we say this? If if the Warsaw Pact uh, was making an alliance with Canada, you know, how yeah. would we feel about that? Right. We would be very concerned about that. I mean, look what we did over Cuba. Exactly. You know, we right. almost went to blows over Cuba. Yeah. Uh, and we, you know, so there is a a certain hypocrisy there, right? We have our Monroe mm -hmm. Doctrine. We say and our Monroe Doctrine says, look, it, not just North America. But North industry. and South America, that's yeah. our playground. Everybody mm -hmm. stays out. That's our sphere of influence. That's right. Thou shalt not tread here. But nobody else can have a sphere of influence. <laughs> right. And so that, that's, uh, that's kind of a uh, a problem, I think. Um, so, but, but again, from the Russian perspective, uh, NATO's a threat in his worldview, okay? Uh, but it begs the question, is, is what's being done here in Russia's best interest or is it in 
Putin's best interest. I mean, he's president for life, but that doesn't mean he, you know, he can't get got, um, <clears throat> you know, so is he protecting his throne here, you know, in, in a time honored sort of authoritarian response to a th- internal threats as you go to war. Mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> You know, when Monica Lewinsky scandal broke, Clinton launched Scud missile or not Scud, but cruise missiles into Sudan, right? Oh, was, that, yeah. was that Operation Haiti? Desert Fox? Yeah, whatever it was. Yeah. Desert Hama Hama. Yeah. Um, but you know, you know, it's it's look at the monkey, look at the monkey, right? That's why the organ grinder is there. They the say thing. that Reagan did the same thing when he went into Grenada. Yeah. I mean, you know, so it, it's not an unusual maneuver that if you've got domestic problems to attack somebody else. Mm-hmm. Um but, you know, he also, he came up in the USSR, right? I mean, he was, what, 40-ish when the USSR broke up back in 91? Mm-hmm. He's 69 now, so somebody do the math. Um, so the question becomes, is he mentally slipping? You know, is, is that a problem? I mean, it, it, it wouldn't be surprising, right, if somebody said, well, he's got early onset Alzheimer's or he's just gone power mad or, you know, we wouldn't go, oh, that's unusual. He's only 26, uh, you, you know, somebody says, well, he's 70 years old and he's starting to go. You're like, mm, well, okay, makes sense. Um, he's some, he seems much more cognitively together than our, our sitting administration. I'll say that <laughs> you make a fair point. You make a fair point. Um, but again, how much of that is controlled? Uh, what's going on? And, and, and maybe it's not a matter of, maybe it's a matter of degree. It's not, you know, a wild swing to the point where he's just, what am I supposed to say now, Nancy? You know, it's not, not that bad, but it, it may well be that he's always just disliked the West. He's, I mean, cause he grew up in an area where, you know, he remembers the USSR fondly, right? He was a KGB guy. He was part of the power elite. Um, maybe he's now just feeling like, well, you know, get towards the end of things. I've got some domestic issues here. Um, screw them guys. Yeah. So is it worse now? I don't know. I mean, but it, it is not unusual for a dictator to make decisions that are best for him and not best for his own country. So I, it, in, in general, I think we end up with more questions than we do answers. Um, I agree with you. So, so what's our long-term projection here, right? What, what, if we can't really tell what his desired end state is, and I think that's, that's moving, you know, it, it, maybe it was originally, I want all of Ukraine. Now it's maybe, I want guarantees that Ukraine will be neutral. I want some territory and then I'll leave. I mean, I think he's going to have to shift his, his conditions of victory. But isn't that akin to, uh, if we did do that, isn't that again, akin to appeasement? And then we're just waiting for the other shoe to drop at some point, you know, when the peace, when that's not enough. The argument is to be made, but I mean, if you're the Ukraine, do you really care at this point? Mm-hmm. Or are you like, look, yeah. we'll give you Donbass, just get the hell out. Stop yeah. dropping artillery shells long enough for me to get these people out of this theater in Maripol. Exactly. You know, right. I mean, you know stop. We've got, millions of my people are now living in Poland and they're, they're, we've got a Ukrainian diaspora. I'd like to get back to normal. I'd like to turn the lights back on. I mean, so is it really Zelensky's problem to worry about the global strategic political problems here? Probably I, I not. And, and if I'm him, I'm probably not worried about it at all. I've got my people to worry about. That's, that's my concern. You know, but for the West and the EU, the West, NATO, yeah. Right. And I think we're kind of chomping at the bit a little too much. At least we're making, we're, we're rattling sabers just as hard as he is. Um, and, you know, he's made those, those comments about his nuclear, you know, reminding us that he has, he's a nuclear power. I think largely to just keep, make sure NATO stays out of this. Mm-hmm. Because he, Russia cannot win a conventional war with the West. You just can't. Hell no. You know, if like there was to, ever any doubt what you're seeing in Ukraine, right. nails that coffin shut. Now, I, I think that, you know, traditionally you see the Russians rise to the occasion when the Rodina is threatened. I mean, I think if you start rolling tanks across the border, I think you would see troop motivation skyrocket. You know, the Russians are a lot of things, but they are particularly uh, patriotic. Yeah. And I think we could hold them at their border. I definitely, yeah. I wouldn't want to be rolling into Russia. It's anytime, been tried, so. right? It's been yeah. Tried. Many uh, times. Uh, particularly in like, I don't know, the winter. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I just what I, I think Putin's going to move his conditions of victory to a point where he can at some point, and I think we'd all be well advised to encourage him to do this, is to declare victory and go home. Yeah, because right? he can't lose and go home because I don't think he would survive politically if he lost and went home. So he's kind of got to win. Well, what what does winning look like? All right. Um, so. 
It, does winning look like I got the Dunboss region and maybe a few miles more? Yeah. And we'll I punish, stop there. I punish them for their cheek and they will not be joining NATO. And I show them what they can expect if they, from the Russians, you know, I mean, he can spin it however he wants. Just yeah, well, that means wants. Zelensky has to go back in and amend that constitution to, to include the, mm -hmm. you know, his, basically yeah. his demands. That would be a pretty good win. Yeah. And that would be you know, maybe a tough pill for Zelensky to swallow. But again, it, it's, I think you can easily say that to your populace when you're like, look, we're starving. We're getting blitzed. Um, you know, all of our women and children have left town. The ones that haven't left are dead. Yeah. I made some, I made a hard choice. I had two, two difficult choices, you know, two decisions, a decision between two difficult uh, responses here. And I, I took the one that I thought would keep the most people alive. And I tell you, it might even, I hate the option of appeasement. It, it just tears at my soul. However, comma, you know, it might show China that taking Taiwan is not going to be as easy as you think. And there may be the world condemnation and sanctions coming that, uh, you know, makes it not worth it right now. Maybe yeah. five, 10 years down the road. But Z, we have to remember, he's just like Putin. He's he's a dictator for life or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And, you know, the good news, I think, in that regard for us is that the Chinese are traditionally, they think very long term. Yes. Um you know, they're there. And right now, let's face it, they're winning the cultural war, right? They, they are really are. We are not doing as well as they are in these long term issues. Um, and they're getting paid, right? We're still paying on the debt to them, the money that, that and they're making a lot of money. If they bullets start flying, they stop making money. Um, so, you know, China's kind of a wild card in all this. But where does this this kind of go long term, I think, is a good question for the Ukrainians. Right. Segways off of what you were just saying. Uh, I just, even with all the things we've talked about here, I think that if the Russians can garner the national will, they're going to win. You know, if they can keep their, their troops on message and they can keep their, their guys rolling forward, they're going to take the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I, just don't, I don't see the Ukraine as being able to, um, win a conventional war with Russia. Now, now let's talk about what does, what does that mean? That means that Russia takes the cities. That means that Russia, you know, takes the roads and the airports. I, I don't see the Russians crushing the Ukrainian spirit. I don't see them defeating their will to fight. Uh, I see the Ukrainians hanging on to hope and, and hope is a, a critical element of a guerrilla war, right? You can't get people to go out and take these risks in inimical to to a guerrilla war if they don't think that there's a possibility of a better tomorrow. So I think they're going to hang on to hope and I think they're going to get massive influxes of money and weaponry from the West. You know, I mean, particularly, you know, Poland, Romania, Hungary, these countries that look, Moldova, if, if you fall, that puts the Russians back on our border. And all these people, all they these don't people, want that. no, they've all been under the Russian heel. They don't want to go back. Uh, and they'll fight not to go back, just like the Ukrainians are fighting. So I think if, and of course, they're, they're thinking the same thing we are. Look, we'd rather have the war fought in your country than our country. So here, here, take a bunch of ammo, take a bunch of, you know, rockets, and here's some money, go, you know, here's some bandages, go forth. I got a couple of points that have been brought up here, TC, I'd like to hit mm -hmm. real quick. Uh, of course, my brother Jeff says, is Putin keeping his shock troops on standby while the conscripts are softening the target? Have you seen any indication that that is true? I don't know about standby. I, I haven't seen him, you know, because the airborne forces in the Soviet military are kind of a, an elite under their own, but elite is a misnomer. You know, the Russian military doesn't hold the place in the social hierarchy that the American military does. It's just not as well thought of. And the artillery is actually kind of thought of better than the conscript infantry guys. The, the uh, mm. what is it? The British call them the poor, bloody infantry. That's what these guys are. They just they're they're really looked down upon in Russian society. They, they hold a very low rank. Um, the special forces guys are a bigger deal to us than they are to the Russians. Mm -hmm. But they still use them in a in a militarily sensical fashion. They still you know use them to grab airfields and whatnot. But the Ukrainians have made some propaganda noise about having wiped out a few of these airborne units that have that have dropped in on. Uh, a couple of airfields, they've captured the airfields, but then of course, you know, there's a hundred guys and then they roll a brigade down the road and stomp on these hundred guys. Yeah. Um, you know, and <laughs> I think it's a common problem for elite soldiers is they, they, they 
like to bite off more than they can chew. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've watched seals, you know, seal team. Well, we got 12 guys. We'll go, we'll take Northern Afghanistan. And you're like, well, you might, maybe not. I don't know. Try something well, else. Yeah. I mean, look what happened in Grenada. You had seal team six was going to take an airfield or what have you. And 12 of them drowned as soon as they jumped out of the, of the plane into rough seas. But yeah. So you can overestimate your, your capabilities easily right. when you're in those units. Yeah. And, and I, I get it. I mean, cause you know, Esprit is a big deal. We've just talked about that and you want okay. it to be higher. So the Russians have the same problem. Um, but, you know, again, shock troops are a, a, a fairly small percentage of your, your force. Um, Jeff was a coastie. I'm sure the, the Coast Guard has elite units, but as a percentage of the entire Coast Guard, how big is it? Yeah. You know, you know, how many rescue swimmers does, does the Coast Guard have? You know, it's right. probably a few dozen out of a force of several thousand. So the same thing is true of, of the shock troops and the, the special forces units. Well, Jeff, was, Jeff was a Marine before he was a coastie. So <laughs> uh, I, I, Bob has a good, good one here too. TC he says the real problem is after is after they come to some agreement, what happens next? When do the Russians invade again? When does Ukraine join NATO regardless of any promises to the contrary? Hmm. You know, excellent questions and, and probably uh, a lot of room for conjecture. There certainly outside my, skill set to answer with any, uh, you know, lasting impact. Uh, you know, the Russians as what was it that line from uh, hunt for October, the Russians don't take a dump without a plan, son. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, the Russians will have a plan for that. Um, I, I think the Ukrainians are probably on their back foot at this point, trying to plan that long term. <clears throat> but you know, the thing is, and I think this is probably Zelensky's priority, stop the bullets from flying. It's a lot easier to talk and have diplomatic relations when people are not killing each other. Um, and in Russia at this point doesn't seem interested in having a serious conversation about stopping this. Well, and there's some, there's some wild cards I want to get to when we start talking about escalation. Cause uh, I don't, whenever that segue comes, I'll, I'm ready to pounce on a few different things here. <laughs> well, yeah. What are the long-term projections here? Right. So, yeah. so the Ukrainians, will likely lose their cities again, if the Russians have the will to, to stick it out. Um, so, okay, they capture, and I put that in air quotes, uh -huh. Ukraine, but can they keep it? And I would argue they can't. And, and the question, and it segues off of what Bob just said, do they want to keep it? Do they want to stay there? I mean, the, the Russians, as we discussed earlier, have a lot of experience with counterinsurgencies. They know what it's going to cost them, what it's going to look like to occupy the Ukraine. And if they didn't a month ago, they certainly do now. I mean, it's there's got to be somebody going, hey, look, this is going to hurt. You know, it's going to hurt a lot more after we've won than it hurts right now because the Ukrainians aren't going to stop. I just can't imagine a more mismanaged affair than this has been from a mili military perspective. Of course, I was a Marine for 23 years. I just I'm dumbfounded by his, you know, why Zelensky wasn't captured within the first 24 hours. You know, why didn't he have operatives in there ready to to take him down? I think we probably would have done that. Um, you know, command and control. Why was it not shut off, whether through cyber or something else? Why was electric warfare not used to, to keep the planes on the ground? There's so many missed opportunities. Why was forward logistics spaces not set up and ready to keep tanks moving? It just, yeah. I could go on and on. I know you could too, TC. It just dumbfounds me how poorly this campaign has been managed. And, and these were all things, by the way, they did when they hit Afghanistan. Hmm. Right. All things that they, that they did when they went. And that was in 79. Yes. Um, but they've forgotten it all. And I, the only thing I can think is, you know, they just thought it would be easier than it is. They, you know, they, they thought that this was just going to be a walk in the park, that they were just going to roll in, you know, like Hitler said of the Soviet Union. All we have to do is kick in the door and the whole thing is going to collapse. Maybe that's what they thought. But you clearly haven't read your history. All right. you, you clearly haven't been paying attention to the Donbass. Um, they're just, that's not who the Ukrainians are. They're not going to roll over and let you just waltz in like that. Which uh, is what Tony said. There's a big difference in the mindset between a defender and an invader. There is. Very true. Especially when your invader is not all on board. I mean, mm -hmm. the Nazis did an awful lot of groundwork beforehand to convince their troops that they were the best. They were fighting the Untermenschen. 
they were they were fighting for Laban's realm for the, the the people to spread out that they it was the right thing for them to do that they were entitled to do it etc 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 so they had that mindset as an invader and they plus they'd had all their successes in, in 39 and 40 with you know Poland France you know they were just they were in their minds they were unstoppable well, Putin's military has none of that yeah and they're well informed enough to realize hey this isn't a Nazi country, like he keeps saying. You know, these aren't the the you know the, the Hitlerians reborn. We're the bad guys here. Um, <laughs> Jeff asked a good question. Why are we here again? Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, it's a valid point. I mean, and again, I just saw my best friend get his face blown off. What yes. the hell are we doing here? And it was well, the same thing we suffered in Vietnam. Well, I was going to say, you know, you and I, when when we rolled across the berm into Kuwait, we were there as, you know, not that we were invading a country, but we were liberating a sovereign nation from the boot hill of Iraq. And I think that our mindset going in was, you know, hell yeah, let's do this. We weren't invading the country as so much as liberating. Maybe he was his propaganda attempted that, like we're going to liberate Ukraine Maybe. from Zelensky and I don't know. <laughs> But it, it also helped in our case that just over the hill, there was a battalion of Kuwaitis, right? Mm -hmm. They were rolling with us. Yeah. There were Saudis there. They were rolling with us. Um, this is all on you, mother. Yes, exactly. This is all on you. And you got to sell that to your people, you know, because the days of, of fighting for the glory of the czar and the empire are long behind you. So, you know, you've got... What are they roll in there with 150,000 guys, roughly, mm -hmm, give or take, mm -hmm. against a country of 43 million? Yeah, their military is smaller, but now they've they've said, look, all the able-bodied men between 18 and 60 got to stay. They can't leave. Um, and I, I haven't heard a whole lot. Maybe I'm sure there are people like fuck that. I'm out of here. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm but I haven't heard a whole lot in the, the media saying that people are trying to get out from under it. That all I'm seeing yeah, is them, them going back and fighting. Which, whether it's true or not, it doesn't matter. They're winning the information war. They are. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we're just not seeing, the, like you said, across the board, we're not seeing the Russians really do what we all thought that they were going to, that they were capable of doing. Uh, I, I really think they've shown their ass here in terms of their lack of capability. Um, but, you know, they, they've, they've got all this military force, and we talk about this disparity of force. They pulled two-thirds of their troops off of the border with China back in February, January, February, they still have troops on the Chinese border. They still have troops in case Poland attacks. They have naval forces on there. They have, you know, they're a world power. They have a lot of force, a lot of military force that is on the books, but they can never be deployed to the Ukraine. They mm -hmm. just, they, they can't put them there because they have other concerns, their own problems that they, they worry about. The Ukrainians are all in. Right. The Ukrainians don't have to worry about the Poles invading. They're not like, oh, the Poles are going to take Lviv. They're not, that's not an issue for them. They're not worried about the Romanians. They're not worried about the Moldovans. Everybody they've got is going east. Um, and that falls right into the military concept of mass, right? They've got they're going to put all of their guys on on one issue and they're going to deal with it. Um so that but that, 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 okay. this right, but to, the, to to that point though, this has always been a problem. Like I think that's why everybody was worried about Belarus. If they're if they start pouring in through Belarus, have they done that yet? To your knowledge, and they're not pouring in. And and Belarus talked about going to war, and his population went bananas. They, they yeah. really didn't like that idea at all. Uh, he started having protests in the streets, so he really backed away from that. But it is a logistics base. They are shifting. Uh, military around in there, aircraft are flying through. Interestingly, I think they've started to have a problem with their trains and their railroad tracks getting blown up. Uh, mm -hmm. The Russians are running uh, train, you know, weapons trains and resupply trains through Belarus, and sabotage has become an issue. Now they're currently treating it as a criminal issue, but I think that'll probably shift fairly quickly because, again, it would be foolish to suggest it's just domestic terrorists that are oh, yeah. domestic guerrilla fighters. I'm sure there are people there that, that whose native language isn't Russian who, you know, mm -hmm. who don't have a, a Belarusian uh, a birth certificate that are blowing things up. Uh, but, you know, and that that's, that's a good thing in the short term for the Ukrainians. I think it presents some concerns in terms of escalation and expansion of the war. Uh, 
you know, but you've got this this problem and and Putin's motivations and, and mental health are, are questionable and he's got nukes. And I I think that's where we start to worry that, you know, frustration, anger, whatever you want to call it or combination thereof madness. He's like, you know, look, we've got 40 of their tanks in this one spot. Let's if we can't get them with a thermobaric or a hypersonic, let's get them with a nuke. And he has used at least two hypersonics that he's claimed, correct? Yeah, that's that's the claim. There's some debate mm-hmm. on that issue, but uh, if he hasn't used them, he's close to being able to use them. I mean, if they're as far out ahead of us as, as we think they are, I mean, we buy our rocket engines from the Russians, you know, so <laughs> we're not building our own, they're building theirs. Uh, so it's, it's certainly theoretically possible. And hypersonics, man, that's a that's a scary thing. I mean, it could be definitely a game changer if they if they take the conventional warhead off and put a tactical nuke or something else on there. It's a, sure. it's, a it's it's big time. Well, I mean, even if it's a if it's just a tungsten penetrator at yeah. Mach five, Mach six, whatever it's hitting, whenever it hits something, that's going to be bad. Oh, I mean, you throw an explosive in there on top of that. Oof. Yeah. Um, but you know, th- their casualty numbers are just going to keep growing. Right. What are their casualty numbers? Do you know? Uh, Last thing I read as of last night was 96 aircraft, 200. This is now, this is all coming from the Ukrainians. So take it with a grain of salt. Yeah. Uh, 96 aircraft destroyed, 230 artillery pieces, 118 helicopters, 70, 75 rocket launchers, you know, MLRS type rocket launchers, not Mm -hmm. handheld, and about 950 other vehicles and something in the neighborhood of 15,000 Russian KIAs. Wow. Uh, you know, of course, Russia disputes that. Um, but, you know, the problem is there are websites out there now that are, you know, putting up casualty numbers based only on actual video that they can verify. So they're like, okay, 30 tanks were destroyed. And then they have video of 30 different tanks destroyed and where they were destroyed. And, you know, so you have to hunt for it, but you can find some fairly accurate non governmental casualty figures well if that 14,000 15,000 whatever uh russian kias and if you factor in a 10 to 1 you know wounded to kill ratio that you're talking about you're talking about a lot of casualties i don't know if i can believe that one yeah i mean it's 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 a bit of a stretch but even say it's one third of that yeah you've been fighting for three weeks yeah against a country you thought you were gonna only have to fight for what five days six days if that you know so there's no reason on earth to believe the Ukrainians aren't going to continue to vex them for decades. If you stay there for decades, you're going to get shot at for decades. Um, and again, they're going to be working with support for money, weapons, probably special operations folks from NATO. Um, Cause if I'm Poland, I'm, I'm deeply concerned. Okay. If I'm, if I'm Moldova, I'm really concerned. I have a friend who's a, a, a police officer in Moldova um, and they are, they're, they're, they're worried about this because they're not NATO country either. Which is why they're they're very happy to give them whatever they need. And uh, again, we saw Poland like, "Hey, want some MIGs? Yeah. Not a problem, <laughs> right?" Um, but of course, in, in the Americans are like, "Hey, hey, whoa, 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 whoa! <laughs> Expansion, escalation. Hang on." But you know what's oh. funny? Uh, somebody made the point that Russia wasn't worried about uh, escalation when they were giving MIGs to to the North Vietnamese. No, not in the slightest. Not at all. Not in the slightest. But, you know, I don't think we were going to pop any nukes over that either. Mm -hmm. And it may be bad to say it, but, you know, the West doesn't get as wrapped up when uh, you've got people killing Vietnamese. They don't get as wrapped up when the Rwandans are killing each other. They don't get all that wrapped up when Pol Pot is running rampant. But once the white people start shooting at each other, then all of a sudden everybody gets kind of, it's an attention getter. And of course, Uh, maybe. I may be well off off base on that. I hope I am, but historically speaking, you can see that trend. Yeah. Um, now the media's made a little bit of hay with that too, especially CNN. Yeah. Well, there's a shot. Yeah. And you know, you would expect it from CNN, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're they're incorrect. Mm, that's true. Um, so, but, but you know, the the escalation I think is something that we should really be concerned with, and that I think is where it it, it starts to impact your audience and, and the viewers here. Because if this is escalates and it turns into a general war, uh, that becomes a problem for everybody very fast. You know, you've already got Belarus as a puppet state, and they're, as we discussed, they're being used as a transshipment point and a, a log base for the Russians. Uh, 
so that that's a potential for escalation, right? Because as soon as that continues, that if they catch a Western Special Forces soldier and they're blowing up a train, it's going to be a, a big, big problem. Yeah. Um, but it would be easy then for Belarus to get drawn into this war with that sort of thing going on. Um, you know, it'd be real easy for them. It, it becomes easier and easier for the president there to make the the point. Hey, look we're already in this war. Our people are being killed by these bastard Ukrainians. We should, we got to get in there and help them stop it. Uh, as we pointed out, Moldova, not a NATO member, um, but very friendly with the West. They were part of the USSR. They, I'm sure like the others, they don't want to repeat that experience. Um, so they're supporting the Ukraine. Putin has already said, look, if you're supporting the Ukraine with weapons and stuff, those weapons shipments are targetable. Yeah. They're fair game. Um, same thing the Germans did in World War II, right? Hey, America, if your ships are floating supplies to England, we're going to sink them. Um, that becomes an escalation. And, you know, the Moldovans, I think, are rightly concerned about getting gobbled up because they don't have the protection of NATO. NATO's yeah. not going to come running to their aid. So if the Ukraine falls, right to the Moldovans. But, uh, man, what a great – he couldn't have done a better job uh, recruiting for NATO. <laughs> right? I mean, when Sweden is like, hey, uh, could we get an application? Yeah, exactly. uh, um, that's 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 a big deal um that's a really big deal uh every other border that every other country that borders nato is is or every other nato country bordering the ukraine is flocking to give them like we talked about aid yes. um and, and it's all targetable according to biden now he, or to biden according to putin, putin. Mm -hmm. um but he hasn't you know he hasn't launched anything into any nato space yet but he's flown drones over uh yeah. poland so far yeah and and again this is what, and the Poles are going to say, hey, you violate our airspace, they're going to shoot one down. Yep. Now the Russians get upset about that. And, you know, this is this is how things get very, very bad very, very quickly. Yes. Um, and we have a few different paths to miscalculation. That just one of them. Yeah. It, it, you know, and they're all in play. Yes. Um, and so it's really easy to see how one little miscalculation ends up with a strike inside a NATO country. And... You know, maybe the U.S. is willing to say, hey, let's, let's go ahead and suck that back. But it, it takes a lot for a sovereign nation to take one on the chin and not respond. I mean, you remember in the first Gulf War, Israel started catching scuds. Yes. <clears throat> and Israel doesn't put up with that kind of crap. I mean, Katusha rockets piss them off, right? <laughs> you know, Let alone a scud, scud in Tel Aviv, man. Right. And, and they did not jump. And it was because the U.S. said, look, we've got a bunch of Arab nations here. As soon as you jump ugly, all these Arab nations are going to bail. Um, and the Israelis to their credit said, okay, we'll, we'll put up with this. Well, are we going to, are we willing to ask that of Poland? Are we willing to ask that of Romania? Um, well, and to, and, you know, how much capability we, you know, we had Delta on the ground, scud hunting. We had the British SAS on the ground, scud hunting general Horner, I think had a tremendous amount of air assets just okay. in, moving across the desert, hunting scuds 24 seven. Mm -hmm. Anytime they would turn the radar on, they were getting schwacked. Right. And they were still able to, those mobile launchers were still able to wreak a lot of havoc and could have tore the Alliance apart. So yeah, yeah to your point, it, it was a very tense moment, I'm sure, for the White House in managing Israel. Right. So, and you had at the time, you know, George Bush, who love him or hate him, was a very skilled, very experienced international diplomat. He'd been the UN, uh, our, our ambassador to the UN. He'd been the, the director of the CIA. This is a guy who was used to talking to other countries. Yeah. I don't know that we have that skill set available to us currently. I'll, I'll say we don't. <laughs> okay. No, I'll go out there on a limb. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, not for nothing, but the other 29 countries, well, 27, most of the countries in NATO are in Europe. Mm -hmm. So Russia presents an existential threat to them that we just don't, that they don't trust. They, they have been the occupier of half of these countries. And there's 29 of them, right? You know, if you take out the U.S. and Canada that are all in Europe, if they decide to go toe to toe with the Russians, and even if they didn't invoke the NATO alliance, which I can't see them doing, they've got more than enough conventional military over there, even with their crappy expenditures and their dependence on the Pax Americana for so yeah. many generations. They could go toe to toe with the Russians conventionally, um, and and everybody knows that. Well, Dr. Gordon Bodson says, you know, if he steps into Poland, that would be World War III. But again, what does stepping into Poland look like if he's already overflew their airspace with a drone this time? Maybe it's a MiG next time. 
maybe, you know, he, he was shelling that base and it's like what, 20 miles from the Polish yeah. border, one errant round. Oops, sorry. And you've, you're, you're in it. Yeah. And, and when these things start to erode, uh, when they start going sideways, then it, you know, the, the governments may say, we're going to go ahead and not respond to that. But that's a whole different story than when two fighters are up in the air and one of them gets shot down and you're asking in the moment that other fighter pilot's going to have the wherewithal to say, no, no, I'm not going to shoot this guy down that just shot my buddy down. I'm going to turn around and go home. Uh, That's a, that's a big ask. Mm -hmm. And uh, fortunately, most of these people that I've met at least over the years do have a good sense of kind of the global responsibilities that they, that they're, they're shouldering. Yeah. But it, it, again, it's a big ask. And, and here, the Russians are clearly the bad guys. It's, it's not a matter of we provoked them. It's a matter of they started this. Here's another thing I worry about. Can we get into the things I worry about? Are we still... I'd love to get into things you worry about, Rich. Uh, are we ready to take Johnny King's question on? Yes. Okay. Could, could you read it back for us for the yeah. folks at home? Let's see here. Johnny said, let's see. Trying to find it, Johnny. Hold one moment. It was an outstanding question. Here we go. Do you think Russia's dismal performance makes the nuclear threat more credible? Yes, and this is why. Uh, They see that dismal performance in a more stark relief than we do. And again, as we said, Putin is already in sort of a questionable mental state, whether he's fully control of his faculties or is just overwhelmingly concerned about keeping his job or whatever. Uh, but if you have a at least questionable person in charge, he's got nukes, this isn't going the way it was projected to him to go in the way he thought it was going to go. He's in his mind, again, being surrounded by enemies, uh, you know, and this isn't going well, you know, you pop attack nuke and it, it solves that immediate problem on the ground. But of course it's, you can't do that. And, not expect everybody on the planet to know you did right because as soon as that nuke goes off everyone is going to know uh and the ukrainians will absolutely make the most propaganda out of that they can and then it makes it difficult for china to stay in your corner right because then china's like oh yeah dude but you popped a nuke right i mean because that really is the third rail of international geopolitics yeah you know having nukes and using nukes are two vastly different things um, having nukes gets you invited to the big kids table of diplomacy, right? You get, you get a, a, a chair at the table, uh, but actually popping one off is a violation of a bazillion different treaties, uh, as well as, you know, just sort of dirty pool. Uh, yeah. And, and well, you're the invader, right? If we were up on the outskirts of Moscow and then you popped a, a nuke on us, I think you can then make the argument. You may not win, but you could at least make the argument. It's a whole nother story to say, look, we really wanted Kiev and, they wouldn't surrender, so we just freaking nuke their water supply. That'll show them. Uh, it's a tough sell. Yes, it is a tough sell. But again, I, I think that he's held on to his tack nukes for a reason. You know, I, we, I, I'm going to screw the numbers up, but he has 10 times more tactical nukes than we did. And when I, I breezed through the 2010 START Treaty that uh, Obama signed with the, I forget, the Soviet uh, president at the time, may have been Putin. No, it wasn't Putin. Anyway. And it doesn't mention tactical nukes that I could see. So he could say, well, I was just trying to take out a bridge, man. I didn't hurt anybody. No collateral damage in this. I just, I really need to knock out that railway. And I had it um, and play or play stupid for a few weeks. And I've, this administration, you know, Jen Psaki has been very clear that President Biden has not put out any red lines, which doesn't make any sense to me. There needs to be like uh, biological and chemical weapons, red line. Nukes of any type. I don't care what yield it. It could be a you know, a yield to just take out a, a swimming pool. I don't care. You we read that uh, radiological signature in Germany, and and you you're done. Uh, yeah. And and I think also his the the size disparity of the force disparity between him and Ukraine argues against him getting away with using a nuke. Uh-huh. You know, because people are like, oh. You, like to your example, oh, I just want to take out a bridge. I just want to take out this hard point. I just want to take out this road crossing, whatever. Everyone's going to look and say, dude, you've got six times as many tanks as they do. Yeah. You know, you don't need a nuke. You've got 10 times as many soldiers as they do. You don't need a nuke. 
you know, that was unnecessary. And here's the, re- here's the response. It's like, yeah, but I, I can't keep them fueled because I'm too busy giving Europe and, and America my, my fuel. Yeah. And, and so then the, the, the argument goes on and on and on, but nukes are just such an emotional yes. hot point for so much of the world as they should be, as they should be. Um, and I think that if he pops those, if he pops any chemical munitions, uh, but this goes back to our escalation concerns, yes. right? It would be easy for them to do, and it would just be a very, very bad thing to do. I, and again, I think China would have a hard time staying in their corner um, if they did that. Maybe they could, maybe they would, but the smart play, I think, for China at that point is to distance themselves um, if there's a nuke in play. And then what's the response? What's the Western response? Yes. To yeah. I don't um, know. What would we do? Right. Um, because as soon as, you know, we respond in kind, you know, we launch a cruise missile with a nuke into a rail yard with a tack nuke into a rail yard in inside Russia. Yeah. You know, I, I don't think we would drop a nuke on a troop concentration inside the Ukraine. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I just, it's just bad. But you know, and it, it I see a lot of roads, a lot of ways for America to get on this highway and get involved in this um, much to our, I, I think kicking and screaming in a lot of ways, but I don't think, cause I don't think we want to get back into another war we just got out of. Uh, but we've know, gone into Europe. every land war in Europe, kicking and screaming I uh, every it's single cool. one. We, we go yeah. everywhere else and right. And yet we act don't. a fool, but we don't go into Europe easily. Right. But if we do, you know, once the U.S. gets tied up in an in altercation in Europe, then all kinds of things start happening, right? Because, I mean, let's face it, the Pax Americana, as I talked about before, is a real thing. It, you know, there's a lot of people that aren't shooting at each other right now because they don't want to deal with the American response. You know, they don't want to have the U.S. come in there and, and settle things down. So do Pakistan and India start fighting it out at that point? You know, um, North and South Korea, um, the Middle East, that hasn't stopped, right? So does now maybe Iran get a little frisky? You know, some of these regional powers start, you know, jumping ugly. Um, you know, how many of these people that are kept in place by the U.S., the threat of U.S. Uh, negative response decide, hey, this is our moment. This is our chance. You know, let's, let's, let's seize the day. Um, yeah. I think the Pax Americana to me is, is eroding quickly. And I don't know if that's this administration or it's been a slow slide uh, with decisions we've made. I mean, look at Saudi Arabia uh, who relies on us for a lot of security guarantees, but we have not been cozy about some of the proxy wars that they've been waging. So now their, their relationship to, to uh, China grows every single day. And, uh, you know, I'm sure you and like most of our viewers this morning have seen where they're going to start accepting or there's a move afoot to start accepting the Juan for uh, purchases of oil. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, when when the king of Saudi Arabia refuses the phone call from the United States president, I think it sends a pretty clear message. And the UAE, right? Yeah. Yeah. Where they just not pick up the phone. And, and that, it, again, just 10 years ago was unheard of. Unheard of. Unheard of. Five years ago. <laughs> unheard of. One administration ago. Unheard of. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yet here we are. So yeah, all empires crumble and fall. We just like to think that ours isn't going to crumble and fall in our lifetime. Uh, you know, but uh, you know, rough seas ahead, brother. Rough seas ahead. And, yeah. Uh, let's let's talk about a couple other things here. You know, Bob Bill brings up the point. And says uh, we would just call an emergency meeting of the United Nations. That would be devastating. Yeah, they've been quiet in all this, haven't they? I mean, you, you hear a lot about NATO. You hear about about the Russians, the Ukrainians, the Americans. Haven't heard boo from the UN. Mm-hmm. You know, um, but you know, what are they going to do? The Russians are going to veto anything that comes out of there. So, yep. Um, which, which again shows the just how it, when you have a rogue superpower doing things, it's just it, it immobilizes the United Nations. Yeah. Now I want to talk about this because this is just kind of popping on my radar screen, uh, and that is uh, bio labs. And I'm notice that I'm not saying bio weapons labs. I'm saying bio labs that gets people in trouble. <laughs> so it, it appears as though uh, under Secretary of State, I can't remember who the woman's name was. She's like, oh yeah, we have we're, we're, the United States is funding twenty five to thirty bio bio labs in the Ukraine. 
And feeling Congress good. went, we're, we're doing we're feeling, what? We're feeling cute. I think we'll <laughs> and it's like, you're doing what? You're you're like, uh, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, we have to we have to study these deadly pathogens, you know, to make sure that we have a response to it. And like, well, the, are these weaponized? No, 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 no. We would why would we do that? Well, no. But my point is it's playing into Russian propaganda. Uh, and what happens when hope to God, all those um deadly pathogens have been removed from Ukraine, but nobody really seems to know the status. I thought you were in charge. Who's yeah. who, Who's getting those out of there? And <laughs> Russia can obviously make us, if they decided to use biological weapons, they could say, man, we, we hit a bio lab, or I, th I think America did that, or maybe the Ukrainians who's been managing these labs, they're the ones that did it. It could be a quick false flag. And, and here we are, you know, I mean, what's the difference between a biological weapon that goes around the world and a nuke? I don't know. Well, a nuke popping in, in Kiev would be bad, but we saw what happened when a, a bug got out. Mm. I'll put that in quotes in China. You know, the last two <laughs> years we've been living in that. Um, so, you know, weaponized smallpox getting, oh loose, you know, can you imagine? Mm -hmm. um, somebody combines smallpox with the, the common flu or cold and, you know, suddenly we have a real problem. Uh, and you know, all Russia has to do is honestly bomb one of these places and they go, well, you didn't know what, what yeah. how, anthrax got loose how strange what what was anthrax doing here oh. <laughs> you know and then the u.s gets immobilized because congress starts doing this number yeah um, so you know and the russians there are a lot of things but one of them is they're good at geopolitics hmm. you know they're, they're very good at geopolitics and you know it's in their best interest to keep us sidelined at this point do you see any other roads to miscalculation? And we've talked about several, several this oh, morning, God. TC. Any other ones that probably need to be discussed? Uh, well, I mean, you know, I think there's just you're, the only limit is your imagination at this point, yeah. right? I mean, it, it just you know the Lithuanians decide they're going to put some special forces troops on the ground in Belarus uh, to again blow up some trains, or uh, you know, it a, a plane takes a wrong turn in bad weather in Poland and violates Belarus airspace and then gets yeah. shot down. I mean, it's, it's, it's a shooting war between two major powers. Yeah. Then uh, you can debate whether or not Ukraine is a major power, but they're well armed and they're very well motivated. Uh, and they have a history of, you know, kicking ass and taking names and, and not fighting when the convent or not stopping fighting when the conventional war is over. Uh, you know, however that is defined. So I just, I see a real, real potential for problem here across the board. And, you know, again, the, the, our current administration is blaming all of its problems on the Russians uh, and, and their, their issues. So all these things come home to roost in your neighborhood. Uh, you know, this, this is, it becomes a, a, a geopolitical problem for us as a nation but it could also very easily become a problem for you as you're gassing up your car at Costco at, you know, 10 o'clock at night. But yeah, it's, and of course it's not just that or, or rising tide raises all ships as we've talked about, you know, sure. uh, the, the, the transportation industry, isn't just going to absorb those costs. They're going to pass them along to you. Uh, China and uh, Russia account for, I believe the largest amounts of fertilizer and we need it to, to grow our crop. So what is, wheat yields and corn yields going to look like six months from now, a year from now, as this thing drags on. Uh, another one I think is the non-proliferation -prolifer of nuclear weapons across Europe. Now Germany's nervous. They're start spending more money. Sweden, for God's sake, is spending. They can, th those, both of those countries could have a nuke within a year. Yeah. What's and, to stop them? Yeah. Well, it is. And why would they stop? Especially uh -huh. if, they're, if they, if for any, at any point, they decide, you know what, the U.S. isn't going to come help us. Mm -hmm. and, and to a certain extent, I would like to see these other countries start to pull their own weight in terms of their, I mean, because we're the only ones spending over three, what do we spend, three, four percent of our GDP on defense? Right. And when you look at the numbers, our, we're spending more than, what, the next? 26, 20, I think, yeah. Numbers. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. insane. And I'm like, you know, Germany has a, a, a very strong economy. England has a very strong economy. France has a very strong economy. There is no earthly reason why they can't spend an extra couple billion on their own defense. 
There really yeah. is. Yeah, but do we? I, here's my concern. I agree with you 100. percent But that's conventional defense. What if they decide to spin it on a nuclear? And now it's like, well, now we've got more nuclear armed folks around the world. Does that make us safer? I don't know. You that's know, debatable. Again, and that does it make us safer versus does it make the people in Sweden safer? Yeah, uh, and they, and these countries have to weigh that as well, right? Because just because you have nukes, yes, it solves some problems, but it creates a whole raft of other problems. And yeah, because uh, this the Soviet nuclear doctrine is I've heard it described as escalate to de-escalate. <laughs> uh, you know, ours uh, is escalation dominance. You know, we will we will escalate beyond you to a point where you realize this is unreasonable, illogical. You're not willing to waste that. But if they escalate to de-escalate, and that's truly their 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 nuclear strategy, then what does that what does that mean? And again, to your point, TC is. Doesn't that tell Sweden and Germany and some of the other nuclear powers, I want to get some nukes? Yeah, yeah and it might. Um, it very well might. I've always equated our nuclear philosophy to uh, Sean Connery and uh, the Untouchables. You know, they send one of yours to the hospital, you send one of theirs to the morgue. Yes, that's if right. You use a knife, you use a gun. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we want to win not just this fight, we want to win all the fights. Right? We want right. to shut you down. So, does it encourage Sweden to get a nuke? Well, it hasn't up to this point. Mm -hmm. um, will it going forward? I don't know. I mean, I think the cheaper thing for them to do would just be, you know, get a couple more infantry brigades uh, and it's safer and it's easier, more easily uh, defended in the international court. You know, most of these countries are also signatories to the nuclear nonproliferation. So yeah. they, they've already agreed not to do that. So there would be some diplomacy that would have to go on for them to get around that. With security um, guarantees. And with again, security guarantees. And it's only been, it's been less than a century. No one's really eager for the Germans to get a nuke. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was pretty interesting when I'm like, wait a minute, we're encouraging the Germans to raise a large army, march through Poland and fight Russia. <laughs> I, I think you should write that down just so there's no confusion later. You know? I think we've seen that movie before. Have we? <laughs> we know how that ends. Let's yeah. not do that. Um, so to the extent that these people are more interested in their own defense, um, I think that's a good thing. I mean, it's just like when, you know, your a house in your neighborhood gets robbed and then everybody in the neighborhood's like, Oh geez, you know, I need a gun. I need to get an alarm system. I need a dog. Well, now all of a sudden, you know, one of their neighbors is getting mugged and now everybody's like, Oh Jesus, I got to get a gun. Well, yeah, but it's not that simple. Well, you start putting bars on your windows. And next thing you know, your property values go in the toilet. <laughs> Right. You know, getting, getting a gun for you and I, it's like getting a nuke for Sweden. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You got a nuke, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're ready to fight a nuclear war. Yeah. And yeah. someone brought this point up and I want to, I'm trying to find it here. And, and, and that was, you know, uh, let's see here. Tony brought it up. It's just one thing this invasion did was to gut the left's cry for gun control. <laughs> yeah. 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 You see the memes about, well, you know, oh, the second amendment isn't going to protect you against a, uh, the government and yet there's the ukrainians passing out machine guns and telling everybody hey have a block party and make molotov cocktails yeah um, and then jeff says where did the support from even the left uh, that are anti-war come from they would turn a blind eye on every other situation globally similar to this yeah it's true yeah but you know they're, they're they see an act of aggression and you know it's it's pretty easy to point at russia and call them a bully in this and, and most of these people as kids were bullied. So they, they don't like bullies. None of I mean, Americans, we, we like the underdog. Mm -hmm. that, that's sort of still a universal here. We, we root for the underdog. We don't like bullies as a nation. Um, you know, it's, it's a, a rare unifying element in, in our modern America. And when we need, frankly, I mean, yeah. you know, yeah, we can point at a lot of bad things about this, but the silver lining is it, it's, it solved COVID. I mean, COVID isn't a thing in my town anymore. Um, well, no, it, but here again, I think this administration is, as they've, and I hate to say them, but here we go. They've lied so much. And I'll give you my point about that. Uh, so Jen Psaki, as well as others in the administration have said this, that Hunter Biden's laptop is Russian disinformation campaign. Their words, not mine. Uh, from the very beginning, they've said that when of course, the president that she speaks for knows damn well that that is his son's laptop and all those emails that probably had him CC'd on a few of them was as real as the day is long. And now they're saying that uh, these bioweapon 
Biolabs, I'm sorry, Biolabs is a Russian disinformation until an under secretary from the State Department let it slip that, oh, yeah, we've been funding these for years, 25 or 30. We're not talking about one or two, folks, more than two dozen. Yeah, and I'd be interested to know if that person still has her job. So I, well, I'm sure she don't. But it's like, uh, what else are are we being misinformed about? Um, and I, I just, everything is suspect at this point, which is why I think I'm grappling for for information and I'm grappling for where I'm missing out on where this could go because we want to keep, you know, the purpose of the American War Society is to keep folks safe. And one of the ways we do that is providing you with information, right? Sure. An educated populace is, a, in my mind, a safer populace. Yes, sir. Uh, and again, without making any judgment calls on people's political affiliations, it does not hurt you to have more information and not mm -hmm. take any of it for granted. I mean, don't take necessarily anything that's been said on this show. This probably is undermining the brand a little, but as gospel, go out and do your own research, use 100%. this as a starting point and then go forth, you know, do your own research and research your own use case, your own scenario. You know, the, frankly, the threats that I am likely to face in a suburb of Charlotte, North Carolina are vastly different than you're going to face on the Cumberland plateau. Correct. You know, um, you know, it's, it's different for viewers in the Philippines and in Hawaii, um, South you know, Africa, South Africa. Uh, Will Parker has probably the same threats as his mustache does up in Montana. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think his, his mustache is better capable of winning a fist fight. Oh, most definitely. <laughs> you know, uh, but, you know, my point is get this information, go, go get more if it impacts your world and know what's going on. Uh, because it does help you look further towards the horizon. It does help you make individual strategic decisions that make you safer. And, and you know, there's ample training opportunities through the American Warrior Society for tactical training, you know, learning on how to defend yourself in the moment. But it's just as important, in my mind, to avoid the fight altogether. Yes. Um, and if you have a better strategic grasp of what's going on, I think you're in a better position to make decisions that, avoid the iceberg completely instead of having to deal with the actual collision with the iceberg. Uh, as far as that metaphor works at least. Uh, no, I love it. And I think that uh, that's what has always bothered me. If you look at why did this administration, and I, I, I keep pointing fingers at this administration because it's the sitting administration. That's the only person I can blame, but it's not a right or a left issue. It just is what it is, unfortunately. And, and that is why did you not have a Ukrainian ambassador? You know, Mr. Yeah. President, you knew Ukraine was going to be a problem. There was no mistake about that from when you were vice president. So why did you not have one on tap to, to help put out some of these fires before we're in this quagmire that we're currently in? And and that's a good question. And perhaps the the controversy surrounding his son had something to do with that, right? Mm -hmm. Anybody that we picked to go over there is going to be painted. And maybe, you know, you ask me, hey, you want to be the ambassador to Ukraine, I'm like, Ooh, yeah. With your administration, given what's going on with you guys, I'll pass. I mean, I don't know. I honestly don't know why that would be the case. It would seem to me you would want somebody. Um, but Hey, coulda, woulda, shoulda, right? Yeah. Jesse says the reason people value coffee with rich, the information we receive comes with sources and, and rich activity encourages listeners to go do their own research. Well, that's exactly what TC has done today. And again, you're going to have to triangulate the news, folks. You're, some of the stuff you're not going to find on mainstream media. I was interested to find out that if you look at who was reporting about the bio labs and quoting our uh, our senators, congressmen, State Department spokesmen, et cetera, was Al Jazeera's, BBC, et cetera. It wasn't in our American mainstream media. There's a pretty much a lockdown on that information right now, For which, again, makes me scratch my head as to why. Uh, why am I having to go around the world to read what what our, our State Department spokesmen are saying to Marco Rubio? I, I shouldn't have to do that. You shouldn't. But, you know, I think journalism as what we would perceive as a profession over the last you know, several generations, it's not the same now as it was. Um, I mean, I recognize we're getting a little off topic, but it, you're, you're right. I mean, largely what you get from American media is propaganda on either side. You know, and I think you and I have had this conversation before in that, OK, you pick your your meta narrative, whether it's left or right, and then you choose your media outlet accordingly. Uh -huh. um, you know, some of us would like to 
just get the news and make up our own minds. And yes. that is becoming increasingly difficult. And when I've got to go to Al Jazeera to get information that just, that makes my skin crawl. Same. <laughs> I probably Same shouldn't, there. you know, it shouldn't, but it does. Um, you know, and, that, and that's my bias and my issue, not theirs. Yeah. So Dr. Fuller, I've kept you on here almost two hours, sir. My really? goodness. Oh. Uh, I know that uh, you are going to be coming back on the 28th uh, of March. Great. What What are we going to be discussing next Monday, sir? Well, uh, I think that's something you and I got to hammer out, but I would like to see us uh, delve more into you know, maybe the Russian perspective and maybe mm -hmm. where the Russians are coming from on this. And let's try and see what we can do about plumbing the depths of, of their motivations and see what we can do about projecting you know, their actions, look in our crystal ball and, and see what we can figure out that, or maybe we can't figure out anything. And we'll talk <laughs> about, you know, the outstanding hemp products being grown by your friend, Jesse up in the Appalachian mountains. Man, I'm so glad you said that. Cause we got to talk about the rest of our sponsors. Cool fire trainer is another sponsor. Look at that segue. You like that, didn't you? <laughs> I love it. Teed me up beautifully, Dr. Fuller. Uh, cool fire trainer, change out the barrel and the recoil spring. You get felt recoil. Now, why do you want felt recoil? Cause it's really going to enhance your dry fire training. Matter of fact, it's not going to be dry fire anymore. It's going to be cool fire. Please check them out. Uh, although you're going to have to be patient because with all the things going on right now, cool fire is back ordered for months. We also have Mountain Man Medical Man. With the things going on in the world, I'm sure if you ask any resident in Kiev or any of the other cities in the Ukraine, they wish they had that trauma kit. Please, please, please. We've given you information this morning. Arm yourself, please. Arm yourself with the knowledge of how to use that kit from Mountain Man Medical, a co-branded trauma kit. And I'm telling you, like we said, uh, uh, rising tide raises all ships, guys. The price that it's on that Mountain Man Medical Trauma Kit is not going to be the same in a couple months from now. Please pick it up now while you can still afford it. Last but not least, PrecisionHolsters.com. Precision Holsters makers are the Fast Series, the Seaclander Series, as well as the Ultra Appendix Rig that I wear myself. So please check out our sponsors because they keep TC and I bringing you the latest and greatest information. And with that being said, we have uh, Joseph says, great talk, gents. Tony says, great show, gentlemen. TC, thank you so much for taking the time this morning to come on. Thank you, as always, for having me, Rich. It's always a pleasure to join you and your audience. Yeah, same here, sir. And uh, if you would, please close us out. Ladies and gentlemen, the fight is coming. Be ready. <laughs>